about to set the chain up. Cause I be on a roll. Yeah. I just touch up in this bitch. Niggas thought it was a joke. Yeah. Told you I ain't playing with you, niggas. I be charged up, super sane with you, niggas. Shit ain't been the same with you, niggas. Yeah, I told you we the real ass. And I ain't playing with you, niggas. Oh, yeah. What's going on, podcast? I'm your host, CJ King, at CJ underscore is King on Instagram and Twitter, man. And you're locked in with the CJ Brand Experience on today's episode, episode 27 of the Black Voice Podcast, man. My, my guest is no one but my the one, the only, Eric King, man. Man, it's appreciate to have you on the show, man. Pleasure to be here, CJ. Yes, sir, man. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, man. All right, so, you know, Eric, you know, my, my guest, Eric King, man, he is the owner, founder, CEO of... Royal Capital Management LLC. Group LLC. All right. So, with that being said, man, you know, where can they find you? Because uh, you're not on social media, so how can they get in contact with you? I uh, just hit my website at www.royalcapitalmanagementgroup.com. Okay. Okay. You got a number you want to uh, drop? Always uh, 225-678-6185. All right. All right. All right. So, with that being said, before we get into it, I'm gonna ask all my listeners out there if you like the video. Please give me some thumbs up because this is going to be real informational and real fun for me to do. And I hope that you find a lot of value out of it because we're ready, we're ready to talk about fine, you know, uh, you know, personal finance, investing, how can you, you know, uh, create wealth for yourself, all that. Um, if, it, if it has to do with numbers and creating wealth, we're going to talk about it. Uh, with that being said, man, if you're new to the channel, I ask that you please hit that red button, that subscribe button at the bottom left corner. Do that for me one solid. If you're not, welcome back, man. Let's get into it right after these quick messages. Q intro. Let's go. All right, man. So, origin story. Let's get into it. Who are you, man? Uh, so, uh, it's sim simple, really. Uh, my name is Eric King. Mm -hmm. I was born in New Orleans. Uh, my father was an army officer okay. uh, after graduating from uh, Southern University. Uh, uh, he was an ROTC grad and uh, even though I was born in New Orleans, I spent my life traveling the world with my family mm -hmm. and uh, you know, my father's career took us all around. Uh, he uh, retired in 91 as a full bird colonel, okay. uh, but I had by then come back down to Louisiana and gone to LSU, also an ROTC guy and uh, I was now starting my army career. And uh, so the, the, the interesting part about that is that my dad commissioned me into the Army. Really? And uh, we served together for two years, and then I retired him out of the Army. So uh, it was a unique experience to actually mm -hmm. uh, be serving in the Armed Forces with your father uh, for a number of years. And uh, he actually was... Uh, did, you ever, did you ever outrank your father? Or? No, no. Uh, I retired as a major. Uh, he you, retired as a colonel. You, so. that, that, that would be kind of cool. You know, you could, you, <laughs> your dad bosses you around for your whole life, and then you end up outranking and say, no, you need to do this. You yeah, know, that didn't quite work out that way. He was uh, <laughs> he, he, he achieved a couple more ranks than I did. Um, mm -hmm. But he did manage to come over to Korea when I was stationed in Korea. So we actually were on the same continent serving okay. together. So it was, uh, it was always a, a unique experience for that to happen. Okay. Um, so while, uh, in fact, uh, that's how I got into the financial services business, I was in Korea, mm -hmm. and uh, my first battalion commander had all of his lieutenants inside of an auditorium, mm -hmm. and uh, he says, uh, we need a tax officer, mm -hmm. and uh, he had all the lieutenants stand up, and he said, if you're an infantry officer, sit down, you don't know numbers, <laughs> and, uh, which was kind of funny, and uh, so that only left about five of us still standing, because, you know, it was an infantry battalion, so most of the officers were infantry guys, mm -hmm. and uh, he looked at the chemo, it was the chemical officer, he says, uh, you can't do anything unless you're in a mop suit, and so nobody's going to, you know, pay attention to you. he said, uh, medical service guy, because he didn't know my name, because I was just a lowly lieutenant, he said, mm -hmm. medical service guy. You're going to tax school. Pack your bags and don't embarrass me. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's when I came on to uh, the tax field. And from there, it just progressed. And uh, he gave me my first, quote, side hustle. Okay. So I was a lieutenant in the Army, and I was also doing taxes uh, for the troops, which was you know gratis. But in the classes, they talked about the different investments in retirement and, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And uh, back then, in the, uh, in the 80s, uh, there was no retirement plan for Army officers. Uh, if you did 20 years, you got to retire, but if you didn't, then you, you walked away with nothing. Wow. And, uh, and so I thought, hey, what an opportunity. And so I started helping my friends and, and my commanders to open up IRAs, and hmm. that's how my career started. Okay. So, how would you go about opening up an IRA today for the people? 
All right, so IRAs are, are easy to do, right? Uh, you, you sit down with somebody like myself, a financial mm -hmm. advisor, uh, start to select um, what would be an appropriate IRA for you, uh, an investment vehicle. Um, when starting out, you know, most people recommend a mutual fund is, mm -hmm. is something to start out with. Uh, for those that don't understand what a mutual fund is, it's really just professional management of large batches of money. Okay. And the mutual fund part is the fact that mutually they gather money from many different clients and then they buy portfolios and uh, each portfolio has a theme. So whether it's uh, uh, small small capitalization companies, uh, growing companies, growth and in income companies, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes they're geographical. So sometimes it might be Euro specific, it may be Asia, it may yeah. be Latin America. So, but uh, you know, a good solid growth mutual fund is always a, a great place to start your IRA, especially when you're younger. Yeah, oh, man, because if, well, for those who do not know what IRA stands for, IRA individual account. account. You know, I've always been trying to, you know, start my my own IRA uh, mutual fund. Is it, um, you know, because uh, I actually got one with Acorns. You know, I've been I told you that, that a while back when I was at um, at the office. You know, uh, because for me watching a bunch of the YouTube tutorials and the YouTube videos, man, they always say the best thing to do is well, it's compound interest because all the money you know in the mutual fund is compounded. You know. Can you speak on compound interest? Absolutely. So, um, you know, before we get into compound interest, we need to kind of, have to understand how we measure mm -hmm. um, um, rates of return. So, uh, the rule of 72 is just a mathematical axiom, really. And what it says is that if you take your average rate of return and you divide it into the number 72, it'll give you the number of years it takes your money to double. Mm -hmm. And that may not sound sound exciting to most people, but the reality is the same amount of time it takes one dollar to turn into two will take five hundred thousand dollars and turn it into a million. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, if if uh, if you were making a nine percent return, you divide nine into seventy two, and and that's eight years. So every eight years, your money would double. Okay. Um, you know, of course, if you have a low return, it takes longer. So if mm -hmm. you get a, a three percent return, then it would take you know twenty one years for your money to double. Something ridiculous. What's the 18. best percentage rate to go for? Um, uh, that's you know that's kind of a loaded question. Best mm -hmm. percentage rate. Obviously, you want the you, you want the biggest percentage rate you can get, right? So right. the money doubles doubles faster. But I mean, you know, if you use standard numbers of, of what's been going on, and then nobody knows what the future is going to hold. But if you just look at the history of things like the S and P, uh, it's averaged it's averaged uh, pretty close to twelve percent a year. Um, you know, so uh, you know an an, uh, an S and P investment that was fifty years ago would have doubled about every six years. Okay. Um, and and that's uh, uh, you know and so the, you see a lot of people guys like uh, Dave Ramsey will talk mm -hmm. about twelve percent returns. Uh, they're not actually saying that you get twelve percent. They're just kind of average. They're just looking at the average and what history says. But I mean, nobody knows what you're going to get next year, right? It could be right. thirty five. It could be minus seventy. Right. You know, you just don't know. Yeah. Uh, but over a long a long period of time and, and looking back historically, that's how they're basing those numbers on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you know. Um, Einstein said, you know, the most powerful force in the universe was compound interest, right? Right. So like uh, each one to a world. There you go. So, uh, uh, you know, so that's how we measure it. You know, we use the 72 to measure it. And then you really look at a simple example. If you invested $10,000 and you were getting 12%, 12 then that money would double every six years. Mm -hmm. So simply put, you know, that $10,000 in six years would be 20 and in 12 years would be 40 and, then, you right. know, in 18 years it'd be 80 and so on and so on. How would, how would you go about you know, encouraging people to actually start investing because there are a lot of people, you know, who are fearful of investing because they, they you know, not because they also, you know, one, they're uneducated about the market. Two, you know, they're probably fearful that, you know, that, that they, you know, of losing the money, losing their money. Uh, so, you know, uh, fear is a terrible thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a Christian as well. So, you know, I don't believe I, I was made with a spirit of fear. So uh, fear is a terrible thing because fear is what holds you back from achieving your goals and your dreams, Excellent. regardless of what they are. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the market, whether we're talking about your education, your career. Uh, if you're scared to move forward, you're not going to. But that doesn't mean you just take risks. People stuck in their comfort zone. Uh, absolutely, you know, but you don't just take risks, you know. Uh, you know, just wildly. Right. Uh, and so that's why, you know, when we start out uh, in, in our office, we start people out mutual funds because they're, they're diversified, large portfolios. Mm -hmm. They're professionally managed. Uh, a lot of the funds we use have managers that have been around for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. So they've seen up markets, they've seen down markets, and they've managed through them. Right. Uh, you know, the reality is in, when you're trying to accumulate wealth, mm -hmm. you, you want a lot of down market so you can buy cheap. Facts. Right? So, uh, uh, you yeah. know, the reality, you know, the whole buy low, sell high, mm -hmm. uh, that's a real axiom. So uh, if yeah. you can get a lot of down markets when you're accumulating wealth, you can buy a lot of cheap stuff. And then, you know, when you're ready to live on your wealth, mm -hmm. you want it to come back. And we're going to talk about that because, you know, right, we're currently, we're what the longest 
bull market that's ever existed. We are. You know, and for those who don't know what follows bull markets, <laughs> bear markets always follow bull markets. <laughs> and bull markets always follow bear markets. But we're going to talk about that later before we get into that. Um, so how would you how would you best advise people, you know, to, to manage their money in their 20s and 30s? All right, so there's some very simple axioms that we have to believe, right? Mm -hmm. So the first, of course, is there's not a Fortune 500 company on the planet that doesn't have a budget. Okay. They have budget officers, they have budget departments, right? So if you don't have a budget, then you can't manage your money. Right. And, and people, you know, you said the word budget and, and, and people get scared and their eyes roll back and like, ah, I'm not doing that, I hate, I hate budgets. Uh, and I think that's because uh, we have a mis misnomer of what a budget is. Mm -hmm. uh, see, nothing stands still in this universe. Everything's always in motion. Okay. And your money's no different. Okay, and, Isaac Newton. <laughs> I heard Isaac Newton. So your, your budget is you telling your money what you want it to do. Okay. And so if you look at your budget as you commanding your, your dollars, mm -hmm. uh, then that takes all the, the, the mis misnomer about this budget's restricting or I don't want to have bag lunches. No, it's you telling your money how you want it to treat you and what you want it to do. That's a quote. So you're in charge and that's what your budget is, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the first, first thing in your budget uh, should be you. Okay. Because you earn, you, gotta, you, you, you earn the first, check. Right? Yep. You earn the check. You should be first on the list, right? Uh, you know, if you're in my house, you're gonna you gonna do ten percent to God first. And you're gonna be second. <laughs> right. But uh, you know, so you know, you, you start off that way. You're at the mm -hmm. top of the list because you earned it. And then second on the list is the, is the, is the second most important thing in your life. That's probably your rent or your mortgage, mm -hmm. right? And the third most important thing is probably you know food. Right. Okay, so why don't people understand, you know, the importance of paying themselves first? Because when people get, you know, get their money from their paycheck, it's like they always uh, spend it on their bills first before they take, you know, put a, uh, have a set side, you know, set amount to pay for themselves, to pay themselves. And, so, and some of that's just, uh, you know, lack of priority, but I think mm -hmm. most of it's just uh, the old axiom is you got to save a little. Mm -hmm. And we're not really saving, we're paying ourselves first. So we're moving ourselves to the front of the list, not the bottom of the list. Mm -hmm. Because evidently, you know, there's always going to be too much month at the end of your money. Mm -hmm. Right? So there's always one more thing you could have had and then you run out of money. Right. And if you put yourself at the bottom of that list, then you never, ever, ever put anything aside for yourself. Mm -hmm. And one thing's for sure, there's only two things that are going to happen. You know, you're either going to live too long or die too soon. Uh, but if you don't save for the future, there's going to be nothing there. Right. And so you have to put yourself first so that you don't run out of money before you get to you. Okay. Uh, because without you, there's no money to be made. Without your income, you, you, you can't do anything. And so that's just, it's just a paradigm shift. You mm -hmm. know, we need to shift our way we think about things. And how, do we shift, how do we shift that way of thinking, especially when in the black community? Uh, I think it's just hearing and, and listening. I think we can comprehend things very well. I mean, the black community is no different than any other community, mm -hmm. uh, except, well, you know, we, we're kind of lagged a little bit behind in, in some of the things that we believe. And, and the some of our, barrel mentality. Well, in some of our traditions, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this wasn't a real big, you know, and, you know, if you were denied access to different things, then, you know, you were limited to what you mm -hmm. could do. But now that we're, we're not limited, uh, we have to understand that what we really need to do is, is reorganize our priorities, right? And our priorities has got to put us at the top. Right. And if we don't do that, then we can never generate wealth. And if we don't generate wealth, we can't pass wealth on. And if we don't pass wealth on, we can't create old money in black families. Right. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's, that's very important how you say that, because that's how you create generational wealth. That's one reason how you, way how you can create generational wealth. All right. So what's another way that people can manage their money? Other than creating a budget. Well, okay. So a budget is really powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. The second is you want to start investing as early as you possibly can, because Compound interest works over time, and you never get the time back. Man, that's one thing I wish that I would have learned when I was 18. You know, so it's never it's never too late to start. Mm -hmm. You know, but every everybody should have started yesterday. Uh, <laughs> More than longer than yesterday. Uh, you know, because you don't get the time back. Right. And, and people think it's well, you know, it's uh, it's it's only a few years. I'll, I'll just wait till I get out of college. But if you just run a compound interest simulator, and you can look up any of them on Google, just look up compound interest uh, calculators. And if you put in a calculator for, let's just say, somebody that was you know 20 years old, mm -hmm. and they they invested two thousand dollars a year for six years mm -hmm. and stopped, right. And then when they were age 60, they retired. And you run that compound interest simulator to somebody that waited those six years, started investing $2,000 a year, and did not stop, mm -hmm. and did it for 60 years, believe it or not, the guy that stopped after six years has more money. Wow. 
And see, so you don't have to believe that. That's just math. Yeah. And so go ahead, Google yourself yeah, up and Google a compound it up, interest right. calculator. You know, put in those numbers, and mm -hmm. then you can believe it for yourself. You, you know, I always find myself. I, I always play with the compound interest calculator. You know what? <laughs> and everything that I found, you know, like if you like for every year that you normally wait, you're potentially costing yourself a million dollar mistake. It is, and you know, uh, because it's the it's the compounding of the last doubling period that you miss, not mm -hmm. the first. You know, you think you're just skipping the first one, but you're not. You're skipping the last one, mm -hmm. and the you know, last one's the big one. Like that's how Warren Buffett. They, they say well, Warren Buffett didn't make majority more majority of his money until after his 50th birthday, and he used the you know the benefits of compound interest. Right, and you know he was a buy and hold kind of guy, so mm -hmm. he, he bought and held and bought and held, and and he let he let the market did what the market's done, mm -hmm. and he took advantage of the, those upward averages over 20 and 30 years, and right. he's a very wealthy man. Okay, yeah, facts. You know, everybody should you know should have you know uh, Warren Buffett as some form of role model, especially if you're trying to get an investment. He know? is uh, very very intelligent, one of probably the best investors on the on the planet. They say he's the number. They say he's the number one. <coughs> you know, I wouldn't argue that. I, I definitely put him there in one, two, or when, three. Right when, when he speaks, the financial world listens. You know, uh, you know he, he can move he can move a market. He's got that kind of money, right? Yeah. All right. So other than so other than budget budgeting and investing as early as possible, are there any other ways that People who are in their, you know, in their twenties, you know, in thirties, you know, who are just starting because you know we, us as as young millennials, you know, we are about to, we're like, what, what, what does it say? We're in the uh, the generation that's about to have, that, that's about to like dominate the working force market. So which means that we're about to have a lot of uh, buying power. We will have the, you know, the ability to, you know, say what markets are going to, uh, you know, be be successful and what products aren't going to be successful. So, other than budgeting and investing, what are the two? Uh, are there any other ways that we can uh, manage our money? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that we have to think about is our needs list and our wants list. Mm. And our wants list is so large. Oh yes. Right. You yeah. know, there's oh, yes. the there's the new Charger, Jordans. there's the Lamborghini, there's the Jordans. Uh, the Rolex, you know, is. there's the Rolex, you know, we, got, we have to get that. And, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things if you can afford them. Mm -hmm. uh, but until you can afford them, they're a problem because those things are going to cost you your wealth. Mm -hmm. Because if you bury yourself in debt, whether it's uh, on, uh, you know, in things and shoes and clothes, uh, if you bury yourself in debt, then what are you going to invest? Because mm -hmm. you have to pay debt off, right? Okay. So that's a problem. Uh, so, you know, that's a key is you have to manage your debt picture. Yeah. Uh, and that goes for school debt too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to manage that. You need to be frugal about when you're taking loans and what you're taking. Uh, you know, your job is, is, is school, but that's not that, that if you don't have something to pay for that, then you need a job, mm -hmm. right? So you need to work while you're going to school. And I mean, I know the axioms, I got to study. I tell, nobody studies that much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you go to three classes in a day, I would I would wage you I'd give you a hundred dollar bills if you could find me five of your friends that after three classes they spent an hour studying every day after those three classes I'd give you a hundred dollars right now you can't that find sounds like two. a challenge it <laughs> is right uh, so the reality is is that if you went to class for three hours on any given day mm -hmm. you studied each class for three hours an hour each for each class yeah. first of all you'd be a straight A student right because if you were able to go over your yeah. classwork for an hour after the class every time. You'd be straight A student. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't understand things like cramming because you'd actually know the material. Uh, so if if you've only spent six hours a day doing you can that, you say that again. <laughs> uh, you know, if you've only spent six hours a day doing that, what if you put four or five hours into a job? Mm -hmm. Now we're at a nine-hour day. I bet you, you could still make the frat party. I bet you, you could still make the next gathering. I bet you can still catch the football game or the basketball game. Uh, you know, so that becomes time management. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing is is managing your budget is try to limit your debt by getting a job. If you weren't a trust baby or have mm -hmm. your education paid for either on a scholarship or something else, and you're in the world of loans, you want to minimize those loans because yeah. they will cripple you if you just take everything you're, you're eligible for. Thanks. You know, and that's that's a that's a key problem. Uh, kids will take everything that they say they can get. And come out of school with one hundred forty thousand dollars of student loan. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to talk about that because <laughs> I feel like in, in 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 all the gurus that you know that you know on you know YouTube and uh, running the market and got their own shows that you know and podcasts, they're always talking about it. How the next crash is most likely going to be on the backs of student loans. Uh, but what crash is that going to be, right? Because how does student loan affects the market? How, okay, uh, and this is what, this is how they say it's not coming from my own words. So I'm just repeating. All right, so they say that 
it's going to affect us to the market because you know when 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 let's say Bob Bob gra graduates from school right look Bob has two hundred thousand uh, pl plus student loans that he, that he took that he took out right so but Bob has you know the two hundred thousand dollars of student loans but his job is only going to keep you know he's not making six figures so he, nope. he's probably making what fifty to eighty let's say he's making fifty to eighty thousand right you know out of that. He wants Bob wants still wants to live, right? But because he had, you know he he feel like you know he's been in school his whole entire life, he wants to go buy that car that he always wants. So he goes buys you know the new beam the new Beamer. Again, his right? wallet is exceeding his need. He goes buys that uh you know uh that 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 really nice house, you which know. he can't qualify for because he's got two hundred thousand dollars with debt and a fifty thousand dollar income. So mm -hmm. he's got to rent yeah. because you know he can't get a mortgage. Well, man, but back you know back back then people you could get houses that they couldn't afford and bank would approve them because oh you got this nice paying job with you know uh, with benefits and, and some people say that caused the crash of two thousand eight yeah so. right so but like they said all these things you know that that you know that our generation is going to be faced with right we must be we still want to live you still got your other bills to pay you still got to eat you want to you know and you actually still enjoy your life right when the market hits and you know we're not we're not gonna own up to it because human nature we're not we never really own up to our own faults our own mistakes we're gonna say oh man college did that you know uh, hey you know but, you know but it was you that accepted those loans in college it was you that made the decision i'm not gonna work 25 hours a week mm -hmm. uh it was you that made those decisions and said i'll just manage that debt later and that's a poor decision and mm -hmm. every poor decision has consequences yeah whether they're immediate or in the future if you make poor decisions there are consequences. If you wait those six years to do that investment, you're going to have mm -hmm. less money than the person that started six years earlier. Right. If you do the same thing, so you know that's that's that. Those are decisions that you have to make early in life. You know, again, if I told you, CJ, I've got a, I've got a great investment for you. Mm -hmm. Now it's you know it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars to get in, and and the next day it's going to drop by fifteen percent, and every day after that it's going to go down in value. Don't you want to invest money in on day one and on day two it's going to go down and it's going to continue to go down until it has no value at all. Well then well, why would I invest in that? So why would you buy a new car? That's exactly what that new BMW does. If new BMW, yeah. as soon as you take it off man, the lot, it goes down in value. Goes right into and my it goes question, down man. in value every single day until it's absolutely <laughs> worthless. And yet we'll, we'll finance it and spend forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 on that car mm -hmm. knowing it's going to be worth less tomorrow. That goes right to my next question. Money traps, right? Money traps to avoid your twenties and thirties, man. Because me personally, I fell, you know, face first into that. Yeah, exactly. You just, you literally just painted the whole entire picture of what I, the, the trap I fell into. Like it was no avoiding it. You know, I brought a whole a brand new car, um, and then as soon as I brought it, and uh, you know, that, that, that's when I got bombarded with YouTube videos and podcasts. About talking about you know buy you know you should never buy a brand new car you should get it was like I wish I would have told yeah yeah but yeah I've been saying this sooner you know so yeah so I'm I'm asked out I got a brand new car you know as they say you know when the, I, when the I bet you money I ain't gonna buy a years. brand new one I bet you money I ain't gonna buy a brand new one no more. <laughs> Say when the, when the when the student's ready, the teacher appears. We, you know that that that's not a new mantra. Don't buy a brand new car, buy used. I mean. <laughs> You know, you mentioned a guy that earlier that doesn't buy brand new cars and he's worth billions, but he says he doesn't do it. Right. You know, so rumor has it he does have a private does jet not brand, brand new car. Probably bought that used too. Mm. <laughs> <clears throat> mm. What are some other money traps that you should that we should be avoiding? You know, so you that know. you have your credit card debt, right? Unsecured debt. Oh, man, that's just that's just scares me. You know, uh, we think that we need so much to live on, and you know, and all this drives back to the very first point we made, right? Mm -hmm. So if you set yourself up with a budget and you and you live on less than you make, then you don't have any of these problems. Right. But if live you, below your means. You yeah. live below your means, right? So li you know. Why does why is it so hard for people to do that though? Um, you know, you'll have to answer that question uh, more than I because, uh, you know, the generation that grew up with now and instant everything, mm -hmm. I think it's harder for them to put something off because they don't have to in any, any other part of their life, right? right. If I want to know something, I Google it. Right. And right. I have an instant answer. 
Yeah. Right? I can fact check anything in, in a matter of seconds within my phone or my laptop. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't even have to plan with my friends anymore, right? Mm -hmm. You know, when I was growing up, we had to make a plan. You had to get there. You had to be on time. Because why? Because if you weren't, there was no way for us to contact you because everybody didn't have a cell phone. Right. You know, now we just like, no, I'll hit you up. I'll hit you up. And, you know, that's the whole plan. I'll mm -hmm. hit you up when I'm on the way. And you just tell me where you are. We connect. Right. Right. Those weren't options before. So, you, you know, a generation that never had to plan because it was always instant access, I, I think it's really hard for, for you now to figure out how do I put something off. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, and so the only way to do that is is you have to grab your budget and say, this is me in charge of my dollars. And if you've got to grab hold of that and hang on to that and you will become wealthy because wealth is just a matter of investing for yourself early, managing your money and staying out of debt. Yeah. And that's the that's the cheat code that no one talks about. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I think I really think that, you know, you know, I had cracked the code. Right. You just got to minimize your debt and reinvest the profits. You know, when I stumbled upon that cheat code, I was like, "Yo, that's mind blowing." Because I think if that, if it's if it's that easy, you know, you know, to get wealth and to you know and to really you know quote unquote, you know be rich, that is what everybody you know wants. But no one knows the code. You know, it's not like, it's not like it's not like it's you know it got a billboard that's just sitting there like minimize debt, reinvest profits. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but you know that's not a new story. You know, matter of uh, fact, that's, that's probably a good idea. You know, there are Get a billboard, just put, you want to be rich? Re <laughs> minimize your debt and reinvest profits. You know, there's many books and research has done on millionaires in this country. And the mm -hmm. number of millionaires have increased dramatically. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and we're going to talk about different yeah. books later, I, I believe. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so there's there's no, quite a few of them. And they talk about, you know, the concept of being consistent, investing every month, paying yourself first. And over time, it pays off. It right. pays great dividends. Uh, and and there's no substitute for time. I mean, everybody wants to get rich quick. Everybody wants to everybody wants to be the guy that bought Tito's for seven cents, right? Mm -hmm. And it blew up. You know, everybody wants to get rich quick, and so we're very disappointed when it's not. Right. But the reality, if you just keep plodding along and doing the right things, success is measured success in decades, is not years. It, it, you know, it's not a sprint; it's a marathon. Thanks. Ooh. Well, you quote Nipsey now, <laughs> and the marathon will always continue, man. Oh man, that's crazy. So, uh, because, you know, we, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, the consumer debt because the credit card, because for the longest, I've always been scared of credit cards. Good. You know, it's a healthy fear. I, I have one and the limit is 1,000, you know, it's a thousand, you know, and I refuse like banks always keep trying to call me to, uh, to, to increase it and everything. Now, I know eventually at some point I'm up to, I'm up to up the limit, but you not know, really, you can live on a cash basis. Yeah, you can you can you can plan your expenses out, and when it's time to buy what you want to buy, pull out mm -hmm. your cash and buy it. Yeah, and you know when you're spending cash, you get better deals. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because uh, you know even merchants, you know they pay two three percent to to take your credit card. Yeah, you know, so you you got a margin right there you can work with with cash. You know, no matter what store you're going into, if the merchant's got to pay one and a half two percent mm -hmm. for you to swipe the card, well that gives you one and a half two percent to work with if you got cash. Explain that. <laughs> So, so when someone takes your credit card, the, the, the bank gives them their money, but mm -hmm. they charge them to give it to them. Okay. So if you buy the sandwich at Subway, you know, you spend your $15, the guy at Subway has to pay $1.50 maybe to get that $15. So he only gets 14, 14 okay. or 13.5, depending on how, you know, what kind of processing he has. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a margin. You know, it doesn't sound much on a sandwich, but when, you know, even then, you know, if he doesn't have to pay the, the dollar, dollar and a half to, to run it, he might give you a break. You know, you so might get ten percent so off just because you don't have to run it. So you're saying that you can actually negotiate the price. You, you know, you should you 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 you're recommending sometimes negotiating the price. You know, because if you're you paying, because you're gonna pay in cash. Right. So it's it, it costs less for him to process the cash. I never her, thought. I never thought does, of that. You know, and so you know, for bigger I purposes, it's a big deal, right? So uh -huh. if you're spending a couple thousand, it stopped. So just yeah. just, just re it when it's <clears> Okay. All right. Okay, Wait. Hmm. We're on again. Okay. Continue what you were saying? Yeah. So, you know, that margin mm -hmm. is negotiable because they got to pay it. They don't get to keep it. So if you if you use a credit card, they don't get to keep that money. So if you use cash, why don't you guys split the profits? Mm -hmm. You know, if his processing fee is a point and a half, then why don't you each take, you know, 75 basis points, right? Wow. And, and get a little discount, mm -hmm. you know, it might cover half the taxes or something. Yeah. But, you know, either way, it's, it's better for you yeah. and it's better for the merchant. So it's a win-win mm -hmm. if you don't use a credit card. Hey, I'm gonna start doing that. I'm gonna go because I didn't know that. I didn't know I didn't know you could negotiate prices like that. Everything's a negotiated price. 
That's how we get a free market. That's what markets are all about. It's about negotiating prices, mm -hmm. right? So every stock is a negotiated price. Everything that's on a shelf is a negotiated price. They put a price up there what they think people will pay for it, right? And mm -hmm. if, if, if it's too expensive, people don't buy it. They have to lower the price or the product doesn't sell, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, you know, everything's a negotiated price. Well, who's Chris? Well, you know what? I'll give you that, uh, I'll buy that, that steak for less, for cheaper. I can tell you one thing though, if you don't ask, it's not negotiable. <laughs> hey, facts. <laughs> I believe so. Uh, all right. So, what um, do you think? What uh, buying a house is potentially a, um, a money trap that we should avoid? Um, you know, because you know, because I've been reading, you know, I've been reading up on it a lot, and so you know, and time and time again, so you know, it's cheaper to rent than it is to buy. You know, I'm, you know, I'm talking. You know, sometimes I talk to my mom about it. She always, but she believes that it's cheaper to own than it is to rent. Because at the end of the day, you're spending X amount of money for something you'll never own, right? But then I then I counter and I say, well, all I'm doing is paying the rent. When you when you, when you're you know uh, when you own the house, don't own the property, you gotta pay for the upkeep of the property, you, you know, do. the taxes, the insurance, and all the uh, other hidden fees that comes with it. Where whereas all I'm doing is paying, you know, my rent, and right. I, I don't have to worry about the upkeep of the building because Correct. I don't because that's you know the property management job. Uh, but you're also giving away the equity, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the value of the house that you're building. Uh, so the, the house, uh, if the property value goes up, you give that away if you're renting. Mm -hmm. uh, if, well, once you pay for it, you actually own the house, mm -hmm. uh, then the value of that house becomes an asset. So if you sell that house, you, you get all that money. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you this, because I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go this way with it. Because I just finished reading, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? You know, for, uh, for those who don't, who haven't read that book, it's actually a really good book. I feel like it changed my life uh, for the better. Um, but in one, one of the key aspects and lessons that he taught and he preached in the book was that your house that you live in is not an asset. All right. Because he says you have to live somewhere. Right. Yeah, he said you have to live somewhere, but the house that you, li the house that you live in isn't an asset because, uh, because you, you know, it, it's taking money out of your pocket. Is that 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 house and the house that uh, that house that you're living in? <coughs> not an asset. Not an asset. Okay. Uh, so you, I, so you have to remember when that book was written, mm -hmm. um, and like all things in in the world, technology changes and even burst markets that weren't markets before. Okay. Uh, and so to say that is easy to say when you write your book before Airbnb. Right. Okay. So now Airbnb is so popular that they're putting restrictions on in, in the city of New Orleans, as you know, because mm -hmm. because it's it's jeopardizing or threatening the, the hotel oh, industry. They're scared. Right? They're scared because why? It's a new technology. Uh, it's embraced by the millennials, which is the largest population group that's coming in money and how they travel, how they how they vacation, mm -hmm. and how they share assets now is changing the world, you know? So right. we can talk about Lyft, we can talk YouTube, Airbnb is the same thing, mm -hmm. right? So your house is, in fact, could be a business center, right? Right. So you could be renting out rooms you're not using or weekends you're not home or however you want to designate that, but your house is a true asset. Uh, I doubt if your landlord would take kindly if he looked up and saw his his uh, home or his apartment on the Airbnb website, he'd probably mm -hmm. throw you out. <laughs> uh, so, so that's not only can you buy equity, your property is is potentially income producing uh, as an Airbnb property. Okay. Yeah. But granted, when he wrote that book, Airbnb wasn't a thing. It, it, it wasn't a thing. Technology hasn't had an advance that far to make that a thing. So now it's so a thing. so the, so basically, what you're saying only if you put your property on Airbnb and renting out probably renting out spare rooms or that you're not using, does your house become an asset? Then? No, your your house is 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 a place of storing money, right? So it has equity built in it. And so it's it's a place that you're storing money, equity money, that you do not have to pay for until you cash out, right? So it's basically deferred taxation inside your house. Okay. Because when you you, you buy your house at you know $120,000 and in 10 years or 15 years, it's worth $250,000, mm -hmm. uh, you have an unrealized capital gain embedded in your house that you don't actually have to pay taxes on year after year as it grows up, you know? So it's like any other deferred tax asset. Mm -hmm. uh, until you sell it and realize the gain, then you have to pay taxes on it. So it's just another tax deferred instrument. Uh, and so it's always building wealth, it's building equity, uh, it's always potentially for sale. 
Uh, and then if you add on top of that an mm -hmm. Airbnb or income generating part, part, part purpose to your house, mm -hmm. now you've just accelerated its value. You've just increased it. Hmm. Because not only you're getting equity, you're you're generating income. Right. So it, it becomes a twofer. A BOGO if you would say. Hmm. Okay. Because the whole the whole uh you know, wait mindset that I was thinking of getting into it getting into the real estate game was uh, I was gonna rent first. Because I was gonna when I moved to the city, I was gonna get me a um get me an apartment. And I was gonna because me personally I don't believe I need to, you know, need a three bedroom house or whatever. You know, you know, uh, and I'm just gonna get me a get me an apartment, an apartment complex, right? And then after I save up enough capital, then I was going to uh, you know, get the FHA loan, right? And then put the cause FHA only requires three percent, but I was gonna at least save a minimum of like, at least at least five. Right? And then use that to buy my first real estate property, then rent both sides. So what what if you bought that three bedroom home and was able to uh, Airbnb two of the bedrooms and lived in one because you only needed one? Because when I went to the real estate seminar in New Orleans that was put on by DJ Envy and Larry Morrow, shout out to them two both. Um, they were um, they, they were talking about how but and Sydney Sydney Torres came up and he spoke as well and they were talking about how Sydney flips multifamily so you, he, he's more of the more of the flipper well DJ Envy and Larry they do the rent, the rental uh, aspect the rental aspect right and they kept saying time and time again I kept hearing you know you want to flip multi single families but you want to rent out multifamily. Right, so I find myself, you know, along the lines of, you know, uh, I want to just, I want to buy like a multi family, like a double or at least a fourplex, and rent out each one of those, each one of those right. sides. And so, how the whole technology has changed that market is you no longer need a whole house. Mm -hmm. You don't need a complex. You can rent out literally a room. And so, where you, before you needed a multiplex. Uh, building because you had to rent one side or the other side or two <coughs> sides and, and one side rent would pay the mortgage and, and mm -hmm. maybe give you a little profit for both sides um, or you live on one side and the other side you rent it out and hopefully paid the whole thing now you can literally do that at the room level mm -hmm. and so if you have a multi room house you can make it work right. right so you don't necessarily need a multi multiplex anymore technology has changed and it's it's given the opportunity to make it a multi room project instead of a multi building project mm. Uh, and you know, and that's just you know, and and who knows where we're going to be, you know, ten years from now with right, technology right, right. And, and what else comes about. But that's just one of the the changes that technology has put upon us—an industry that did not exist fifteen years ago. Right. There was no really such thing as that. That that was really unheard of. Mm -hmm. But now we have those things. Yeah, it's know? a it's the same thing concept. You know, as uh, you know, like letting uh, you know, like ten years ago, you probably would never let your daughter. You know, hop into a stranger's car. Exactly. But now you hop. Now you just You know, feel more than comfortable sending her in an Uber. In fact, prefer that she take an Uber, right? Right. Uh, you know, want to make sure she gets there safely. And yeah. Not driving her own self. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, like again, again, it's something that technology brought upon that was not really an option ten years mm -hmm. ago or twenty years ago, okay. or even five years ago. Really. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we don't know where it's coming. You know. All right. So, with that being said, what are some Good things that you know that you know that we should be investing to investing in in our twenties and thirties. Uh, so I'm a big believer in mutual funds. I believe that everybody should have a core investment portfolio. Okay. And it should be you, professionally you, managed. Do you think you should, it's a good idea to have more, more than one mutual fund? Uh, you can multiple. Uh, it really depends on what you can afford. Okay. I mean, when I was in my twenties and thirties, you know, uh, an extra fifty or hundred bucks a month was hard to come by. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, uh, you, you start small and, and grow, right? But the idea is that you start and you start early and you get used to the fact that you're paying yourself first because we're really talking about behavior changes, right? Right. So if your behavior, if you have good habits, you get good results. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you get into the habit of budgeting your money, investing for yourself, paying yourself first, living on less than what you make, if those become your habits, those habits are wealth building habits. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you're doing those things, you will build wealth. Right, and you know we can we can argue or ponder, you know, what's a better stock, whether it's Amazon, whether it's this or that, but none of that really matters, right? right. Uh -huh. The idea is the behavior that you exhibit is really what's going to drive your wealth more than what you buy, mm -hmm. you know. So if you have somebody that's professionally managing, I love mutual funds. It's somebody's job to make money with my money, right? And the way they're they're geared is that they get paid more when they when make they, when me they more, make, yeah. You know, and because because if they're making great decisions and, and the fund is performing well, other people want to get in. So they mm -hmm. get more money that gets attracted to that fund, so they get paid more. Mm -hmm. When my money goes up, they get paid more. Right. So I like it when somebody gets paid more when I make money. 
You know, they're very... They're that's, well, their, that's their incentive to do well. They're, they're very well incentive to make me money because they make more to money for themselves. So I like that. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful place to start, and I think everybody should have a core portfolio. How, how does someone go about gauging their risk level tolerance to do certain things like that? Uh, every, every financial advisor office is going to use some kind of risk tolerance questionnaire. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and what they're going to do is they're just going to ask you different questions about your, your appetite and your feeling about the market and market mm-hmm. results. Uh, you know how how well can you tolerate? You know if your account goes down twenty five percent, you know do you do you have a, you know we call that freak out risk? Do you freak out and sell everything, mm-hmm. right? Because that's just exactly the opposite of what you want to do. You bought high, now you want to sell low. Uh, right, absolute right. bad idea, right? Yeah. Um, so so you need to find out you know what is your risk so that that, that your investments can match accordingly mm-hmm. to where you're where you're going to hit the freak out button and panic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, yeah. I, I took the test and, and everything, and I'm getting I'm categorized as a high risk. Right. See, so, so and you know, in your twenties and thirties, you got a lot of working years ahead of you where you can make up for losses. Mm-hmm. But again, remember, you know, if we buy low and sell high, you know, we like down markets in our twenties and thirties. Yeah. Because we're buying cheap, especially if we don't have a lot of money to buy with. Mm-hmm. You know, so now we can buy cheap and get and get great bargains. You know. Right. I mean, if you know, if Jimmy Choo's shoes all of a sudden went on sale for a hundred bucks, you know, that line would be around the door and down the corner, and they'd be there'd be st- sacks of shoes coming out of there, right? Hey. Because they know one day they're gonna be back to fifteen hundred, two thousand, three thousand. Dollars, right? So they're okay when it goes on sale. Well, we need to kind of think about the market the same way. If we're, mm-hmm. if we're in accumulation, we're okay with some downturns and some sales. You know, that's that's crazy. You mentioned, especially you, you, you mentioned shoes, right? Because that's like a whole you know new market that, that that that's emerging on the backs of technology. I'm not sure if you heard of it, uh, Stock X, right? It's basically like a stock market for things, right? Right? So like you know, if someone like for the new Jordans that come out, right? You know, they're limited in number. Um, people <clears throat> will go to the shoe store and buy, you know, uh, X amount of shoes at, re- at the resale, at the retail price. And then they will resell, and, you know, and, you know, like the flip life that they, you know, that, that's been coined as, you know, for $1,000, $2,000 when the retail price was 200 And people were actually buying it. I know. And, and, you know, those kind of new markets are very interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a conservative kind of guy when it mm-hmm. comes to that. Uh, because just like I don't try to predict what, what the trends are going to be and time the market, um, I, I don't know what the next fads are. But right. I, I, you think, I rely... You think, you think trend, trend, uh, trendy is like a... Is, 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a bad... You know, or no, I don't think it is. But I, what I like it's to a do bad is, way to get is, into it is I like to rely on, on professional management that, mm-hmm. that spends their days vetting these things out for me. Okay. Um, because you know I'm not going to spend that kind of time to figure out if this is the right one, the next one. You know whether this is going to really work, whether the fundamentals are sound or not. I don't want to spend my time doing that, mm-hmm. and so I want to employ somebody that does spend their time to do that, and that they're incentivized to do it and pick wisely. Right. Okay. You know, so I don't have anything against those kind of things. It's just I'm not going to spend the time to figure out which ones where I should go with it. Okay. I feel you. I feel you. Okay. So what are, what are things that should we, should we be looking at? In our twenties and thirties. Uh, so you know, getting started. So you got to think uh, you're going to retire. How, how do we get started? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, you know, first thing I would do, uh, which is exactly what I've done with my daughter, who's in her twenties. Uh, so you know, opened up a, a Roth IRA for her, mm-hmm. and we opened up a what I call a dream fund, right? So that's just that's accumulating your wealth. So she has two accounts going right now, has her first job and the whole bit. Uh, you know, the second thing, um, you know, and this is kind of. A different different road or different scope is kind of for a different generation uh, you know but for all my children when they when they were born I started investing money for them uh, you know I thought the same the doctor did the same thing when I don't have kids right now no time soon um, but I thought about doing the same thing for like when as soon as they would, I, would, I, would, I would open up a mutual fund as you say you know and put in a hundred dollars a month from the day they're born until 18 and then let them have it. You know, uh, so, you know, I, I believe in thinking of a little longer term. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I open $2,000 trust in mutual funds and they get it when they're 60, when they retire. Uh, and and if you do, if you grab your calculator and put $2,000 in and mm-hmm. pick an interest rate you're comfortable with and mm-hmm. let it double over those times, if you use a number like 12 and it doubles every six years, that's 10 doubling periods. If you use a uh, a number like nine, it doubles every eight years, and that's mm-hmm. about uh, eight doubling periods. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just see what that number looks like. I won't give you the answer, but uh, yeah. you, can, you can do it. You can stick hey, it in your calculator. Google it. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you can stick it in your compound interest calculator and come up with some numbers, but I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how a one-time investment just left there for 60 years 
um, just compounds. C compounds and what those numbers look like. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why I do that is because, like all of us, um, we're going to figure out life. Right. We're going to figure out the school thing. We're going to figure out the job thing. We'll probably figure out the family thing. You know, most people figure that out. Some people better than others. You know, so you have some people that make millions and millions of dollars in a lifetime. You have others that just make it by. Mm -hmm. But what you do is you can change the generational picture by saying that everybody in your family, when they get to a certain age, will have a minimum net worth or minimum worth because mm -hmm. you know they could be in huge right. amounts of debt and not have a net worth but a minimum liquid worth of from that two thousand dollars or five thousand dollars or five hundred dollars whatever you side your number is mm -hmm. uh, that number will compound over those time and they will have a number and I'll let you know two thousand dollars if you use even you know you pick the rate that you're comfortable with but if you use the, the return of the S&P that number is going to be in excess of a couple million dollars Man. Uh, but stick in your calculators, right. come up with your own numbers because you don't need me to people, tell you that. People don't know this though. Like, why don't they, you know, it, it, why doesn't school teach us these things? Now, you're asking me to comment on the on the situation of the educational system? <laughs> I got nothing. Uh -huh. I got nothing for you. I don't know why they don't teach you those uh -huh. things. Uh, but if they did, I might not have a job or a company. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> at some point, I guess I ought to be grateful. But no, uh, I, I don't. I don't know why this isn't taught in school. I don't know why the rule of 72 isn't taught. I don't know why uh, the concept of life insurance isn't even taught. I mean, right. I mean, the reality is, is one or two things are going to happen. Like I said before, you're going to live too long or die too soon. Right, right, right. And if you have a family, you know, and for you know, real folks, you have a family out there, you need life insurance. Right. Someone's depending on your check mm -hmm. to, so they can live and they can eat. You should have life insurance. Right. Because here's the thing, right? I, I went to college and I grad went from graduated from Nickel State. My degree was in business finance. Even with a degree in business finance, they was I was not taught this. That's one of the main things that I believe I should have been taught. All right? I agree. Um, I think that I don't understand why in business programs or finance programs that they don't make you go out and get licenses in in the areas of finance or in the areas mm -hmm. of uh, whether it's uh, the SEC or, or life and health or uh, so that you can understand not only the concepts behind it, but the products that drive these things. Right. Uh, you know, I think that should be fundamental. Uh, you know, it should be part of your final exam. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, I didn't I didn't start learning how to really invest and start getting put on the wave of getting a mutual fund and everything. So I really started, you know, really watching a bunch of uh, YouTube videos. And that's when I came to you asking, you know, asking for more information. I was like, yo. How do I, I should be, I should have been been doing this. Absolutely. Like, you know, like, why am I just now getting put on this, yeah. you and, know? And again, we have to change our rhetoric, right? So we mm -hmm. have to, we have to speak differently about investing. It can't be a fear thing. We can't go, oh, the market, it's scary. Right, right, uh, right. You know, we have to think about long terms and not short terms. We really have to start it's, changing. It's, it's better, it's, you, you, you'll be better off, you know, uh, 10 years down the road than if you had never started. You Absolutely. Know? You know, that's how compound interest works, you know, and, and we just, again. Even if you do lose money along the way. You only lose money when you get out. Right. You know, as long as it's as long as it's in there, you know, you still have a chance for it to come back, right? right so, uh, you know, and uh, and you know, we talk about the ten-year decade, the lost decade, and mm -hmm. and how that you know they run all these simulations. Again, technology is an amazing thing, and they run all these simulations. You know, and I think they've now been able to come up with a ten-year stretch where you actually can lose money in the market. Mm -hmm. They can't do it for fifteen. They can't do it for twenty. Uh, there's no such thing as a thirty-year loss decade. So you can't mm -hmm. take any thirty years and come up with a loss scenario. Uh, no matter when you get in, you know, as long as it's a 30 year period, doesn't matter what scenario you pick, you know. So, uh, you know, the, our fear of the market should kind of dissipate, and mm -hmm. we stop, need to stop thinking short term, right? right? You know, when you come down and sit in our office, we're going to talk to you not just about your wealth, but we're going to talk about generational wealth. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about your kids' wealth, your grandkids' wealth, your great grandkids' wealth. Mm -hmm. We want to paint a picture that says, hey, if I did something now. Uh, how does that help my next generation? So if we do the example we talked about, you know, the two thousand dollars, and and that generation when they get to sixty, all of them and all their cousins are all millionaires. Mm -hmm. Do we also write the memoirs to tell them what to do next? You know, because if they've got a million dollars and they really can affect not only that generation, the next generation, but the generation after that. Mm -hmm. So their grandkids could start with thousands and thousands of dollars when they're born, right? Right. So I mean, you could really create a wealth. That, that eventually the money just is so large that it can't go away, you know? And that's just about doing things two and three and four generations and having a, a family mantra that says, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, just like we come together and have Christmas dinner, this is what we do, mm -hmm. right? We provide money for the family and that's our job is to find a space for the family and the, and the wealth 
that the family earns, and the family just takes care of people in the family. Mm -hmm. You know, then not only change families, because if you change a family, you're going to change the neighborhood. If you change the neighborhood, you're going to change the community. You change the community, you change the state. Change the state, change the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it starts with somebody saying, other than me is important. Right. You know, not I work hard for my money, he's going to work hard for his. No, I'm going to have him start where I left off. A new tune. Right, that's that. That's that crab. Yeah, that's getting rid of that crab in the barrel mentality, you know. And that for some reason, like we as a as a people, as a culture, we we just can't seem to get rid of it. Yeah. And we just gotta start celebrating wins, right? Even yeah. the small ones. But everybody's win is a win for you, mm -hmm. right? So I've got to be able to appreciate the fact that you are graduating from law school. I need to get excited. I don't. I can't be mad at you because I didn't graduate from law school. Right. Right. So I need to be excited that you graduated from law school, and I need to figure out well. Well, how do we make this work so that you can be successful? Right. And then you can help somebody else be successful. And you, and we, if we could celebrate our victories instead of being so competitive and saying, oh, I, I, you know, he's no good or I hope he, he fails. I, I hope he doesn't pass the ball. Why, why, does, why would we get into that, that rhetoric, right? Mm -hmm. Why not say, yo, man, study, do good things, send positive vibes your way. Facts, you know, facts, gonna, gonna, pray, gonna, gonna be praying for you, man. Facts. You know, you know Skip that vacation, man. Get those books, right? I should be encouraging you to do great, mm -hmm. right? Because rising tide raises all boats. Right, man. That's man. I'm so glad you said that, man. That is crazy, because man. It, oh, but I even, I'm just lost for words right now, man. That's just crazy, dog. Oh man. And you said that couldn't happen. That you'd be lost for words. <laughs> that's that's one of the few times I've ever been lost for words, especially on 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 my show, man. Yeah, because. All right, so let's move on. Let's move on. How how can we make our money work? How can someone not just not just me or you know our generation, my generation, any my past generations or future generations for that matter? How can we as a as a people make our money work for us instead of us working for our money? All right, so pay yourself first. Mm -hmm. Live live on less than what you make. Okay. If you can master those two concepts, you can forget everything else you heard here today. Mm. You pay yourself first and live on less than you make. You will be okay. You know, and we can talk. You literally just said the cheat code thing. Minimize there you go. debt, reinvest profit. That's really all it is. You know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and I mean, we can talk about how you can change the dynamics of a neighborhood or a company or a mm -hmm. community. You know, about reinvesting in black businesses and 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 and, and uh, you know, spending your dollars in your community. Yeah. And we right. can talk about how that that could build wealth and how that could build wealth in the in the community. Because you know, they say that the study with the black dollar, just, you know, exit the exit our community you know, way ten. I don't know how fast. I forgot to forget the numbers, but it's so much faster than other than other culture. You know. Uh, and I think I think we have to start delivering a superior product. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And we understand that concept when we talk about sports. Right. Right. So when we talk about delivering a superior product, you know, we have athletes like a, you know, you know, Odell Beckham, you know, mm -hmm. that's making millions of dollars a year, you know, uh, you know, we, you know, we have, uh, you know, Jordan and we have LeBron, LeBron and, you know, uh, you know, and, and they're delivering a superior product. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to have our community businesses deliver a superior product. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the dollars, the thing about dollars is they'll just go where they get the most value. Right. They're not really concerned about where that value comes from—a white neighborhood, a black neighborhood, a Jewish neighborhood, an Arab neighborhood. The market doesn't care what color you are. It really doesn't. Uh, and you know that's like saying we're on, a, on an even playing field. We're not, but we still have to generate value for that dollar. Mm -hmm. And the value we generate will attract the dollar because people want value for their money. And so, if you're delivering a superior product, you'll get superior results. Mm -hmm. People will buy that product, right? So we just we just need to focus on developing and, and delivering a superior product versus focus on just trying to invest in a black business. Mm -hmm. Just invest in the pro in the business that gives you the superior product. Okay. And then if you're a black business owner, make your product superior. Right. Okay, so how does someone like that go about, you know, attacking and, and, and um and competing with the you know the massive competition that they that, that may be in their market, you know, that that uh that has you know a bigger budget than they do. Prime example, you know, the, the chicken sandwich wars, right? That 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 hit out, that hit the the, the country, you know, crazy this these, these past couple of days, right? You know, how does someone, you know, like a black business <clears throat> who also sells chicken sandwiches compete with the likes of Popeyes and Chick Fil A? Uh, you know, persistence. Mm -hmm. Don't give up, and have a plan. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you're not going to be Popeyes overnight. Facts. Yeah, but Rome you know, wasn't built in the day. Popeyes wasn't either. Mm -hmm. You know, we forget how many years 
it took before Popeyes even opened their first franchise store. And then those stores became uh, known and then they moved and spread out. And that's true of any business. Mm -hmm. You can start local, you know, you know, the nice thing about now is you don't have to pay for all the advertising you had to pay for before Thanks. because you've got all kinds of technology in your hand that you can promote your business, that you can get Yelps and likes and that you can get reviews done. If you're de developing a superior product, mm -hmm. it'll start there, right? So then you'll get, you'll get the reviews that says, hey, if you're in this place, you need to go here, mm -hmm. right? Because it's the best chicken sandwich you've ever eaten. Right. Well, that catches on. Mm -hmm. And you just keep promoting. You just keep putting out the best chicken sandwich you've ever eaten. Mm -hmm. Word of mouth happens. Instagram happens. You know, YouTube happens. Next thing you know, driving and dives are at your spot talking about, hey, we heard this is the best chicken sandwich on the planet. Right, right, right. right and right. so you start to build your reputation. Mm -hmm. You just have to be persistent and you have to de develop and deliver a superior product. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and you want to deliver that wow factor. Right. Right. <clears throat> you want to wow people, man. They... The experience, I mean, because, you know, the, the, the enjoyment of that chicken sandwich is going to be over in about five minutes. Right. You know, uh, but... You got to keep them coming back. Yeah, but the experience that you deliver, that needs to be wow. That's the memory that lasts, right? Nobody goes to Disney World and remembers standing in line for nine hours. They remember all the cool stuff at Disney World, right? Right, right. You know, because they deliver such a wow factor that in your memory, when you think back, you forget it was hot. You stand in line for an hour and a half. You walk back and forth, didn't get to that ride. You know what you remember is 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 the is the memories that were fun created, and yeah. created, and the time that you spent together, and and, all, and and that experience is what brought you back, yeah. and what puts in your head. We have to do that in our businesses. When you walk into quote a black business, you should know, hey, this is a black business. You should walk in and says, this is a superior product. I'm the you know I walked in here and wow the customer service was on point mm -hmm. you know the the product I was using on point whether that's food whether it's a mechanic I don't care what it is right product was on point the follow-up was on point they treated me with respect they, mm -hmm. they they charged me a fair rate right you know they they made me feel like I was the only person they had to deal with that day hmm. that's an experience we have to learn to to not only deliver but we should expect you know, we should have enough pride in what we do that when we see a black business, we should expect that kind of service. We should expect right. that kind of environment, <clears throat> you know? Yeah, you know, because that's a, that's a major wave that's actually been hitting the streets these days, you know, supporting black-owned, buying black, and, you know, I don't know uh, how... What happened? No, I'm just saying Oh, oh okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know how, you know, if how, how prevalent it was back, in, in, back in, in your day, but, like, with the help of benefit of social media, like... Buying black has been like a huge wave that a lot of people I think have been on now. And I think that, but I think the hesitant is we need to buy superior and just be superior. Mm -hmm. You know, no, you know, when you when you when you look at at, at the you know the top five basketball players in the NBA, mm -hmm. nobody cares what color they are. They care that they're the best players in the NBA, right? And they get paid like the best players in the NBA, and they're and they're and they're and the people that are watching and attending the games. Are from all backgrounds, nationalities, and races, mm -hmm. but they come to see the best. Right. Be the best. People will come and see the best. Right. Man. That's that's uh, that's so key. That's major key right there. That's like that's a. Man, you you dropping gems, man. Yeah, I try. You dropping gems, man. Man, look, pause right now, man. You heard these gems, man. You better like this video, man. <laughs> and subscribe to this channel. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Uh, how how do you how do you think us as you know because you know you know we are in the biggest like I said earlier we were gonna get talk talk about the bull the bull market right so we're in the longest bull market that has ever hit the history right in that's history. great and as I said earlier you know bull mar bear mar bear markets follow bull markets right so how should we pe prepare for the oncoming bear market that's the soon to follow all right so um, and what do you think that what's gonna be is gonna cause the bear the bear market when right? the bear market's gonna happen what's gonna cause the bear market Nobody really knows for sure. It's, it's, it's something that's already <clears throat> affecting us right now that we that's, like we're just sleeping, constantly sleeping under the rug. Um, I, I can't say that. Mm -hmm. um, Which is why I feel like a lot of people are saying, you know, there's the student loan crisis. Uh, but, it could be, mm -hmm. um, you know, but we might fix that crisis, right? Mm -hmm. So there's legislation that that's talk about being brought up. Not with and, Trump. And you guys are lawyers and, <laughs> and are soon to be attorneys. Not with Trump. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, you're soon to be attorneys and, and you know... Uh, uh, the nice thing about the the sanctuary of a state mm -hmm. is you don't need federal permission. Mm. So you can come together as a community and decide 
our kids are not going to have student loans. We're going to pay as a community by chipping and paying off. So you don't need federal permission to do those things. Hmm. Nobody tells you how to spend your money. See, so if, you're, if, if, if your concept is, I've got to wait for Washington to do it, hmm. then that's because you want, you want other people's help to bring it together. But if you want to start a campaign to eliminate black debt at, at Southern Law School, you can do that. You can do a GoFundMe and pay off all the debt if you're successful. So you don't need anybody's permission. They don't need to pass a law for you to do that. Hmm. You know, so, you know, he's a convenient excuse to, to blame Washington, but that's just an excuse not to go to work. Right, right. Right. So, right, right, right. so you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that the guy that spoke at Morehouse did not ask his permission. Could I relieve all this? Could I pay all this him. debt? I need to get him. I'm about to graduate in <laughs> you know, this year. I'm pretty sure he didn't call Washington. And says, "Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. I need your permission." Right, right. He says, "My money, and this is what I'm going to do with it." And he did. Well, that's true for what you want to do too. So. You know, so will it cost the next crisis? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, are we in the longest bull market? That's a fact. When's the next bear market? <coughs> I don't know. How do we prepare for it? Um, I think that you look at your long-term plans and and realize that, hey, if I'm investing for the long-term wealth, that a bear market does me good. Mm -hmm. And that is as long as I've got a consistent and I'm investing month after month, week after week, or however my, my cycle's going, uh, that bear market will help me because as things go down, I can keep buying into it. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, because people are still going to need houses. People are still going to need toilet paper. You know, and the, Apple ain't going nowhere. Walmart's you know, not well, going Well, you know, the, the people you that know, provide Amazon those services are, are still going to be around, right? Mm -hmm. And I rely on professional management to make sure that they, they, they buy the company that's actually going to be around to do that. Mm -hmm. And my job is to keep staying true to my investments, right? Don't hit the panic button. Don't hit the freak out risk button. Mm -hmm. And go, it's down 40. I'm out. Mm -hmm. And then cash my tickets in rather than... It's down forty. Yes, buy more. Buy more right. right, buy more. In fact, in fact, I'm I'm not going out. I'm not going out to dinner at all this month because I'm buying more because it's cheap and I need to get it right. Right, right, uh, right. You know, so we need to change what, what we think about that bear market as as a time for for opportunities. You know? Oh, no, oh, oh, I'm looking. I look at the bear market as as, as they say, billionaires are know? born in bear markets. Mm, right, right. So yeah, because I'm looking for the um, yeah. the, um you know, the but there's bear there's some market. schools of thought that think that it's not coming. That technology is pushing off the bear market because we're getting more efficient in what we do, mm -hmm. and so we're 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 using our efficiencies to continue to keep pushing this. Yeah, because so if, there's I mean, hard to say you, when it's coming. And right, what's right. Because if you look at if you look at history, right, there was a really long bull market leading up into going into the roaring twenties, right. That was their decade of bull market. Right. Not as long as this one. But Not as yeah. long as this one, but that was their. That, that was that the. That's like the second one right after us, right? Yeah, the Roaring Twenties. Yeah, the Roaring Twenties. And then now you see us. You know, next year is 2019, right? We're going to go into the Roaring Twenties of. Again. Yeah. You know, or you know, like we just don't know. We don't know, because if I knew that answer, then I would be the financial advisor. I'd be the only one on the planet because mm -hmm. I'd have the answer, and right. so everybody would want to have me do their investing. If you, uh, if you knew the answer, would you share it with us? Of course I would, <laughs> if you were my client. <laughs> but, uh, yes, you know, so nobody really knows. So, you know, so since you can't predict, you have to prepare. Mm -hmm. And you prepare by, by putting out your plan your plan together, looking at the risk you're willing to take, mm -hmm. you know, managing your freak out risk, and, and going mm -hmm. ahead and sticking with your plan. You know, if you stick with your plan and, you know, bull market's <clears> going to happen, uh, take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're accumulating wealth, that's the time to take advantage of those bull markets. You know, if you've got... The money on the sideline, get it, you know, buy cheap, you know, mm -hmm. buy low. Uh, and take advantage of that. Let that compounding work in your favor. Right. You know, um, you know, there's a there's a, a thing called dollar cost averaging driving the average cost of your of your shares down and and just briefly describe that. That's basically says if you continue to buy as the market goes down, even when the market gets back to zero, you could you could have exponential gains. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just because you're paying your dollar cost averaging. So if you're you're buying a hundred dollars a month and it's at ten dollars, you get ten the first month. If it goes to five, you get, you know, your hundred dollars now buys twenty. Mm -hmm. You know, if it goes to four, you get twenty five. If it goes to two, you get fifty. And it goes back up to two and back up to four and back up to five and it finally gets back to ten. Mm -hmm. All of your shares that you bought are worth ten dollars. Right. And because you bought a lot of them cheaper, you you drove down your average cost. Right. And so even though for your in your this scenario, the market went from ten, went down and came back to ten, you're not at zero. Right, because you were able to buy, and so your average cost may be three fifty. Mm -hmm. So you actually made a profit of seven dollars and fifty cents on every single share. Hmm. Uh, and so that's just part of sticking with your plan, being yeah. consistent, being persistent. Oh, consistency is major key. Consistency is major. Like you know, it's like consistency when done right hits every time. You know, it hits a target every single time. 
you know. Uh, all right, so I want I want to you know switch gears. I want to ask you because you know, uh, you know with you know, the student debt crisis is out of control. It right? is. Right? I agree. All right. So okay. So we agree on that. With that being said, do you think even do you still do you even think college is even is even necessary at this point? Because you have you know major five Fortune five hundred companies like Google, Amazon, that you know they're removing the requirement of having a, a, a college degree. They're moving the requirement of the degree, but they're not moving the requirement of what they want people to do. Right. Well, yeah, you know, okay. You know, so they still want the capabilities that a lot of people learned in college. Mm -hmm. You know, they still want that critical thinking that they learned. They still want people to, that know how to learn and can and can operate and can program and can and can pro, you know and that now where they learn that they're removing where you have to learn that from mm -hmm. but they still want the skill sets right right so whether it's but college people, but people will teach tech, people teach will be able to teach themselves you know what they what they learn <coughs> what they can learn in college for way far cheaper uh, you know uh, again uh, it's the skill set that they're buying they're not buying your degree mm -hmm. uh, so wherever and however you acquire that skill set that's what they're buying. And if that isn't, if that comes through college, then they're buying, mm -hmm. they're they're buying that. If it's not, if it's coming through some kind of trade school or whatever, right, right. they're buying the skill set because right. it's the skill set that they need. And every company needs the skill sets, right? So mm -hmm. every company defines what skill sets do we need to take our company to the next level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, historically we've just called that a college degree. Yeah. But really, what we're talking about is the skill set that that comes out of that. Right. Right. So you know, uh, if I need an engineer, I need him to be able to do engineering work. Right. And I don't care how he learned to do engineering work, he needs to be able to do engineering work. Right. Uh, and so, you know, to say whether college is required or not required, I think learning institutions are going to always be required because people have to learn to acquire those skill sets. Mm -hmm. Now, whether we redefine colleges and we go from brick and mortar to to video and screen and... Right, right, right. I, I have. Yeah, I, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you what right. the future looks like, but I will tell you, education will Edu never oh, go ed away. Education is never going away, and right? those skill sets that. will never right. go away. Right. Now, how we acquire those will probably change, like technology has changed everything else we've done. Yeah, you know, virtual classes are now more popular. Online, like YouTube classes are more University, popular. YouTube mm -hmm. University, right? So we're changing how we're delivering mm -hmm. the education, but the education is still required. The skill sets are still required. That mm -hmm. what you want to call that. Right, you know, because you, you know, like, because there's been multiple studies done where they say, you know, my generation of millennials, we are because you know, you know, the cost of tuition has you know significantly impacted us because you know the, you know, the millennials, we're, we're you know, we're not buying houses, we're not starting families like you know, like past generations, right? So <clears throat> they say that we will probably be the generation to where we don't require our children to go to college because we saw what it did to us, and if you if we only look, if we're looking at the cost of inflation, you know. College is only going to keep going up. There's nothing to keep to stop them from keeping raising their their, their cost of their tuition. Uh, you know, I believe that competition is true, mm -hmm. and that if somebody develops a better product, a mm -hmm. superior product, right, right, dollars will gravitate toward that superior product. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're a university. I don't care if you're a car wash, uh, a car wash. A car washer, if you develop a superior product, that's where money's going to go mm -hmm. because that's where they want to acquire. So if you develop a way to acquire the skill sets that are needed mm -hmm. and that's at a, at a lower cost or higher efficiency rate, then, then dollars are going to head that way. Right. Uh, I, and I can't say that colleges won't develop their own. Mm -hmm. right? So they understand the lay of the land. They understand what's going on as well. So you know they may develop that efficiency. So I can't say tuition is going to keep tenure to go up. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the tuition only goes as high as the market will bear. Right. When the market says that is not the value anymore, then it can't go up anymore. Right, and and, and that's what I feel like. That's what the, the millennials are going to face. It's like you know, it's it, it, it's ridiculous that the fact that you know that people were getting hundreds and two hundred thousand and, and more than that. They got there's reports of God of people who are, have who when, after they finish all their schooling, millions of dollars in student loan. Oh yeah. And it's, it's crazy because it's like, yo, there, there's no one job that you're going to have. No, I can't say gonna, that, but, you know. Well, if, unless you had the mutual fund and, hit, and they hit you up. Hey, you know. You know but, you, you know, know but if they don't, I mean. You know, but there's, I mean, there's, there's, always, there's always a lot of high-paying jobs, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, you come out of school, and I, you know, it's absurd to come out of school with a half million dollar worth of debt. You know, but if you're making two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars a year, you got a fighting chance. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, you you do, know, you do. so, I mean, so there are still professions that pay extremely well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know. But I think we also have to th think about what we're trying to accomplish when we go to school, right? right? What we're trying, what skill sets are we trying to acquire, mm -hmm. you know? And it doesn't make sense that we started at JUCO, right, a junior college, right? So we get the basics out of the way. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Do we have to go to, you know, some of the the the, the more expensive private colleges, or can we get what we need from a different source? Mm -hmm. You know, so I think you, each person needs to sit down and evaluate what is it that they're trying to get out of school, right? You know, you're in law school. There's there's thousands of law schools around the country, right. and they and they all charge different rates, right? Right. So you know, how do you pick the law school you want to go to, right? Mm -hmm. And and are you picking for the name, or do you believe that that value of that name? Can network you into a position where it will it will impact significantly impact your job, mm -hmm. you know. But if the job you're looking for isn't in that arena, do you necessarily need that, right? right. So, I mean, I think we just need to sit down and, and evaluate what is it that we're trying to accomplish, and and how can I do that the most efficient way possible, mm -hmm. you know. And I we think just had to, we just gotta have that conversation. We gotta have that conversation, and I right. think I think universities are having that conversation right now. Okay, how can they become more efficient? Uh, because you know their their heads aren't buried in the sand. They don't think they're the only deal going. Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out how they continue to bring value to their students, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, 15, 20 years ago, there was hardly any of the universities that had online classes. Now there's hardly any universities that don't. Right. Right. So so things are changing. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to see what the future holds. Oh, yeah. I uh, can't wait to see where, what my grandkids going to do. Right. Because, uh -huh. you know, I have a grandson. You do. Yeah, uh, you do have one. I do. <laughs> you know, and, you know, and his mutual fund's already set up. Just hey, in case you want to know. Hey. Uh, you know, and. Can you set up a mutual fund for an unborn child? Uh, you cannot. This person <laughs> does have to be alive. Uh, but you can set yours up and transfer money. So it's all good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, but, uh, yeah. So I'm excited what the future holds. I'm very optimistic. Yeah. Of, of the future. I think the millennials are going to do things that, that have been unprecedented. I think they're going to do it at a faster rate than has ever been done. I think we're going to change paradigms. Mm -hmm. It's glad to know that not everybody, that not everybody old generation is bagging on millennials. We get enough of that. Uh, we get know. enough of that. And to have someone like you in your in your generation, I forget what generation you're a member of, but the, you know, the uh, X, oh you're an X, okay. So you know, to have someone like you, you know, who's a generation Xer, you know, sit next to a millennium and say, you know what? I believe in you. Guys. I do. You I know, do. that means a lot to us. You know, I really do. I, I think we're going to see things that have been unprecedented. Mm -hmm. I think you guys are going to create a whole new financial dynamic to the world. Um, I think you guys understand world competition and global competition. Uh, you know, where we talked more about when I was coming out of college, we really talked about local competition. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you succeed in your state? You know, you guys can compete with the whole world. Right. You know, that's exciting to me. Right. I mean, because we're using the internet too. Right. Yeah. But I mean, the same YouTube video you watch, somebody in Czechoslovakia can watch that same YouTube video. So you're competing with that person. You're not just competing right. with the, the person in the chair next to you. Right. Right. You know? Right. So I think you guys are going to approach these problems completely different than, and even even come up with thoughts that, that have never even been conjured yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know things like. Airbnb, yeah. right? The, you know that, that what a great concept, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's not just changing a, a financial uh, a market, but it's changing how people view vacation and time away and and mm. travel. I mean, you're changing the way people think about things, and I'm excited to see what you guys right. do for that. Right. But then you also got people who are members of your generation who are so free for mm -hmm. us, and they try to pass laws to. Excess out. Well, I, I wouldn't say that. You know, uh, I think people work with what they have, and they mm -hmm. do the best they can with what they got to work with. And again, you know, if we don't have the conversations, if we don't sit down and talk about it, and we're just operating off a platform of fear or, or not knowing, then we're going to make decisions based mm -hmm. on fear and not right. knowing. But people are right. naturally afraid of change, though. You know, uh, absolutely. So change is hard, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, behavior finance is hard. You know, it's easy for me to say, pay yourself first, have a budget, spend less you make. You know, that's that's that's. Simple, but it's not easy. Right, right. You know, it's easier said than done. You know, because those, those Jordans are calling you, man. Uh -huh. You know, it's calling you. Yeah. And, uh, and why should that person have that car? And I'm driving this one, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, so it's simple, just not easy. And I and I think, you know, there's always been communication issues between generations, right? Right. You know, whether it was the baby boomers and the Xers like me, because mm -hmm. uh, I just missed the boom generation. Um, you know, and then there's lies, and that, but there's always been that that communication gap of of what do we value, what are, what's our value proposition, you know, mm -hmm. and what we consider normal, the new normal, right? right? And so uh, the access, the amount of information that millennials have access to, is insane, right? When you compare it to the generation before, you know, I mean, I grew up in school with encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. 
you may have never seen an encyclopedia. And and for a good Man, reason. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not I'm I'm not a I'm not a uh, what do you call it? I'm not a uh, a Z, man. Yeah, but uh, I'm not a Z. Like yeah. millennials, we grew up with you know we grew up before the internet too. Uh not really. We're, you were, we're, you, were we're, you were very young. I'm, before I'm, the a, I'm at that age to where we was we was a, we, you know where. Our parents, which was y'all, right. kicked us out the house and said, "Go have fun. Don't come. You know, don't come back in. Right, you, that, know? That, you know. That, and you know, that, if you're thirsty, go drink out the hose right, outside you know, the corner that, of the that, house." That was some old. That was some old time. That was some old time lineage. But you know, the reality is, is that uh, you know, when you know, when you were younger, you know, we couldn't let you just outside the house. You know, neighborhoods mm -hmm. weren't. You know, neighborhoods had changed. You know, somebody had to watch you. Yeah, you, know, you could go out the house with this person watching or that person watching, but you know, a lot of times you had to wait. Mm -hmm. Right, you know. Uh, you know, safe space is hard to come by, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that that changed the dynamics of of, of socialism and, and the things that we do and how we communicate and how we relate to other people. Uh, you know, so those things have to change, and and those paradigms are hard to break down, mm -hmm. right? So you know, when we when we start breaking those down, but you know, you know, grand grandparents now are on on social media, so they can keep up with their grandkids. Yeah. Right? They didn't they didn't they didn't promote social media. In fact they fought it with their kids. Yeah. But you know, grandkids is a whole new level. Right. right? And so they want to be all in and know what the grandkids are doing. So they'll they'll get on the Instagram or the Facebook or wherever they can communicate with their grandkids. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean the fact that, you know, I grew up in a generation where you actually wrote a letter and you could actually wait for seven days or eight days for a response mm -hmm. or two weeks. Man, if you've got to wait more than five seconds for a response now, they wonder why you ignore me. Right? I, I, I just text you. You know, why didn't you text me back? You know, so uh -huh. our expectations have changed, mm -hmm. right? And so that that in itself changes everything that's around us. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think it's I you know, I think some of it's really good. I think some of it's not so good. But I think I think every generation has had that change mm -hmm. that progressed the world and change that that kind of derailed us, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, plastic bottles being one, you know, bottled water, right? So right. it was great having drinking water; you could take it with you, but now we pollute our oceans with it, right? right. So I mean, you know, I think I, I think that uh, the nice thing about having all that data is that mm -hmm. you guys can probably do a better job predicting the outcomes of decisions that you make right, than, we right. had to, than our hypothesis, which really couldn't do a lot of predicting. You know, so I, again, I'm I'm excited for what you guys are going to bring to the world, and I just hope I live long enough to enjoy it. All right, man. As long as you take care of yourself, you got it. <laughs> you know. All right. So, you know, let's moving on. Okay. So, uh, I want to ask you because since we were, we were we were on the topic of you know of, of college and everything, right? Col you know, the the new semester, the fall semester just started, right? We have there's going to be a bunch of high of college you know new new coming college students, right? Who are about to get their first refund checks? How would you advise them? What, would, what how would you advise them to do? What what should be their first thing that they do with it? Uh, well, even before they got their check, they need to consider what funds that they actually need mm -hmm. versus what was available. You know, because that's you're you're getting into a de debt scenario, right? Just because mm -hmm. you have credit and just because you can get unsecured debt, do you necessarily need to take it? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think we need to be more judicious about the process of selecting how much money we actually need. Mm -hmm. You know, we spoke earlier about I think you should get a job so you can keep your debt to a minimum. Right. Because you you, you gotta know with all the talk and everything that's on, on 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 social media and everything that's on the news. That building up large college debt is a bad idea. Right. I don't think that's a secret to anybody that's starting college right now. Right. Uh, but the solutions of how not to do that has not been widely spread. Mm -hmm. right? right. You know. So. But, but how can they? But how can they take a bad situation and make it turn it good for themselves? Go to work. Start. Mm -hmm. Start generating an income while you're in school. Start. Well, well, for the for the ones who you know, for, for the ones who can't afford to work and they're getting the refund to like basically help them pay their bills and help them survive, right? What you know, they get a, you know an extra one two thousand dollars that they got you know probably. right, but that's a that's a short term thing. So you need something that's short and conservative because you're going to need that money in the next six or eight months. Right. right, that's not a long term investment goal. That's that's just how do I make a couple extra point, percentage points mm -hmm. with this money? And there are conservative investments that can do that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and there are all the traditional conservative investments that can do that. Uh, but if you're taking that money, saying, hey, this is extra money I'm never going to need. I'm just going to invest it for the long haul. Then maybe you shouldn't have taken that money. Mm. Right, so maybe okay, you should so, acquire uh, that debt. Okay, so what you're saying is, you know, if if if, if someone's coming with a with a with a re getting a refund check, you know, they shouldn't go about thinking with the mindset. Okay, so I got this extra, just call it three thousand dollars, whatever. I'm not gonna get involved into forex trading, or I'm not gonna start my mutual fund uh, with that instead. Uh, well, it, 
you know, yes, because if, if they've got that surplus money that they're saying, I'm going to invest this money for the next 60 years, then maybe they, they didn't acquire that debt to begin with. Hmm. You know, uh, so you know that that's that's three thousand dollars of debt they could have avoided because they only needed three thousand dollars less. Mm, okay. You, you know, so they don't have to accumulate the, that debt picture thinking they're going to invest their way out of it, mm. right? So, okay, that's what you're saying. You know, yeah. so you're taking yeah. a bad habit and you're going to try to invest your way out of that bad habit when the idea is to spend less than you make, right? So mm -hmm. if if we're back to our priorities and we get them right. Then we don't we don't take the surplus, mm -hmm. right? We take what we need when we need it, and we we try to figure out how do we reduce that need, mm -hmm. right? So we don't you know grants grants and scholarships are a wonderful thing because you don't have to pay it back. They don't they don't amass the debt, right. you know. So if you can use grants and scholarships and a job instead of grants and scholarship and a loan, then you're going to be ten times better than the person that went grant scholarship loan, mm -hmm. right? So so you have to work really hard to figure out okay, well what can I bear? What can I do? You know, what kind of effort do I want to put in this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, and uh, everybody can afford to work. Right. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> you're right. You're right. All right. So how can we as, you know, um, we as a people do better at building our credit? Uh, you know, we're going to go back to this song. You're going to try to hear it. Mm -hmm. Manage your debt picture. Okay. Pay yourself first. Hey, you look, I'm not getting minute. tired of it. Hey, the more the more, we, the more we repeat the same thing over and over again, that means it must be true, right? You know, so, I mean, because because your credit is bad because you can't pay the debt in which you acquired. Mm -hmm. So if you did not acquire that debt to begin with, you don't have bad credit. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to build your credit, don't acquire the debt to begin with. Right. Live on less than what you make. I mean, you're going to have bills that you're going to pay that's going to build your credit, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's your that's your mortgage, your cell phone, your car insurance. You know, hopefully you're buying a, a used car that you can afford and you pay cash for it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but you might have a little bit of a note. That's, I don't know. That's not my um, you know, but so those things, mm -hmm. those that payment history is going to build your credit. Right. Uh, but if you don't have debt to, to drag that score down, uh -huh. your credit will continue to go up. Right. You know, so manage your finances, being responsible with your debt, and to take as little debt as you possibly can, mm -hmm. and at some point live debt free. Right. You know, the liberation of living debt free is insane when nobody can call you and tell you that they want some of your paycheck mm -hmm. because you owe nobody. Anything. You know, I I was listening to someone else's podcast, right? And the well, the one the guest that was on, I forget his name, but he he said that the American dream was a sham. And his reasoning for that for saying that it was a sham was because, you know, they sell you on the American dream because it puts you in consumer debt. You know, when you go, you know, you, you want to get the car, that's, you get that car loan, that's debt, right? You go, you want to get the house, you get a mortgage, that's more debt, you know? Uh, and, you know, and, and that's the American dream. Well, I think, I think you're, you look to somebody that's, that's pretty short-sighted, mm -hmm. right? Because the American dream was alive and well long before the credit industry even took place in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, so let's talk about the history of the fact that the credit card industry is relatively new. Is it really? There was no credit in the 30s and 40s. You didn't buy, get credit. You paid cash. If mm. you needed something, you saved up for it and you bought it. And that's how you bought your house, too. Mm. You saved up and you built it one piece at a time. If you, had, you built one room and you built a room on top of it, there was no credit. There was no such thing as credit. So this, this credit industry is something that boomed later in American history. Mm -hmm. It did not exist. So if you go back and, you know, you know, you guys are fact checkers, go back and Google it. When did the credit industry start? And you'll see that the American dream was around long before credit started. Huh. So for somebody to say that the American dream is a sham because they want to put you in consumer debt, uh, that, that's because they don't know their history. Hmm. You know, this credit crisis has come as a part of not the American dream, but of a different mindset of I got to have it right now. Right. And I'm not willing to wait and put my, my nouns off to later. All right. And so that mindset shifted, which is turning the, the debt picture as a nightmare. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have that before there was credit. Right. People bought houses with cash. Mm -hmm. People saved up and bought their car when they got it. People saved up. People did things like layaway. Right. <laughs> where you paid the store or whatever, a little installments, and they held it for you until you paid it off and they delivered it. Mm -hmm. You didn't take it home and say, I'll, I'll pay you later. You didn't spend money you didn't have. Right. So we've changed a paradigm shift that now... We, we spend money we don't have that we're going to get in our next paycheck. We spend money we, have, we haven't we have earned like it's like we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's wrong. You right, know? Right, right, if right. you're not promised tomorrow, how are you making a promise to, to pay somebody tomorrow when you don't know if you're going to be here? Right. So you're spending money you don't have. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Just stop. 
Yeah, he said it's easier said than done. Too. Uh, it, absolutely, he said absolutely. it earlier. You know, you know, but you have to put off your now wants and you have to reduce that need. And mm -hmm. you know what? When you when you write out that priority list, when you command your dollars to do what you want it to right. do, you'll find right. the things at the bottom of the list are things you can do without. Right, behavioral finance, people. Behavioral finance. Yeah, man, crazy. The liberty of living debt free. Like, fi yeah, fin just being fine, but it, being financially literate is like. The key to get that though worth its weight in gold yeah <clears throat> but they're not it's not being taught it's not being taught it's like you it's like people have to stumble upon it to be financially living well no they don't they just have to listen to your podcast facts this episode right here right now like and subscribe you know oh uh, all right so uh let's switch gears for a minute all right so how would you advise someone, you know, in like in, in our generation to seek mentorship in the industry that they're, you know, that they're trying to act, get access to? Well, that's a fantastic question. Um, the neat thing about technology is that when used properly, it mm -hmm. can it's, it can open up an entire world to you. Okay. You know, so now you have the ability to get mentorship through somebody else's podcast or YouTube channel mm. where they're interactive. You mm -hmm. know, so you can you can you can almost literally get the best of the best to interact with you. Right. Uh, you know, uh, for those that want a real personal touch, you know, ask. Right. Right. So, uh, and I didn't say text. I mm -hmm. said ask. Yeah. You know, so if you're looking for a personal touch mentor, mm -hmm. then you need to give a personal touch request. Right. Right. You can't text somebody and says, "Hey, I, I want you to be my mentor." Because if you want to do that, find the best of the best you can on YouTube or, or instant messaging or whatever mm -hmm. is out there. And read it. Right. Follow them. Follow what they do. Send in questions. Send in chat questions or whatever, and get the answers. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you're looking for personal touch, then personally ask somebody. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of knowledge walking around you, and and that are willing to share, but nobody asks. Mm. You know. So just don't be afraid to ask. And you know. And when you're setting a mentor, if you're you're not looking for a surrogate parent. Mm -hmm. Right. So your mentor, your mentor needs. You guys need to set some parameters on. A, how often you're going to meet, and how long this engagement's going to last, mm -hmm. right? So they're not adopting you, right, uh, right, right, right. You know, so you know, you just want to know. Hey, look, you know, I'm really looking to to, to learn and understand more about the things that you do and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and I think you'd be a great mentor. You know, I'd like to continue this for this school year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then at the end of the school year, you know, I, I'm probably going to pursue something differently. But I really would appreciate just being to, to meet with you once a month. Uh, maybe we have lunch or, or a coffee for once a month. We spend a half hour together mm -hmm. and just bounce some things off you. Uh, yeah. About your professional professionalism and what you've done and, and how'd you get with here advice mm -hmm. uh, and you can do that right? right but just remember those parameters you know make sure it's it's a personal touch ask make sure you set a, a time frame on that mm -hmm. you know so that everybody understands what the what the expectations are right I'm looking for half hour of your time once a month you know maybe a, a, an email you know twice a month mm -hmm. you know whatever Providing it is value for the for the mentor and, and so right so that they're, they're not necessarily adopting so, another instead of you like you always just asking. You know, trying to take from them, you just you, you know giving right. something yeah. to them. Uh, you know, and those are the kind of mentor relationships that a they don't always end when they say they're going to end, but they may actually grow up into to bigger relationships. Right. Uh, but there's 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 an end point so that it can end. There's a there's an end date. So mm -hmm. those are things I think are important when trying to find a mentor. Right. Okay, man. That's 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 a really good dime, man. Because there's a lot of people, especially I know, you know, like they, they you know, when you, when you when I'm listening to you know multimillionaires and billionaires speak, right. They always say one of the, the key components to getting to where they are they, they were is having mentors. Right. And, you know, and re remember, a lot of those millionaires that you hear speak, they didn't have the opportunity of YouTube, YouTube education. Right. They didn't have the opportunity to listen to themselves speak or listen to other mentors speak. They couldn't go up and pull up the last conference that that, that person spoke at. They couldn't pull that stuff up. They didn't have access if to If you that. wasn't there, you missed out. Right. So they needed somebody that they could reach out and touch because they didn't have access to other things. Well, technology has changed that. You have access to the greatest minds of the, on, the, on the planet. Mm -hmm. Right? Use them. Yeah, you know, and I was I was talking to somebody you know a while back, right? Not most recently, and they said you know that's a false sense of mentorship for some reason. for some reason. That's what that's what they were arguing. The argument was like that, that's a false sense of mentorship. So a mentorship is someone who you can actually sit down and actually physically touch, like you see with your own personal eyes, instead of you engaging with them on social media or you know or the internet. Uh, you know, 
again, I think I think technology breeds new paradigms. Oh yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I, I, and and in the traditional sense of the word, I'd say they're correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but just because it's always been done that way doesn't necessarily mean there's not another way of doing it. Yeah, there's more than one way to get. You know, and and taking advantage of some of the things that allow us to do like you know, FaceTiming your mentor. Mm. They could be in, in, in you know, overseas. Mm -hmm. And now you can sit face to face via screen right. and have a, a live conversation. Why do we have to be right here? Right, right, right. Why can't I be in Germany and you be in Japan and we have the same conversation looking at each other on a screen? Mm -hmm. We can. Could do that 20 years ago, right. but we can today. Right. So we need to take advantage of those things and, and get out of some of those old paradigm shifts. And, and utilize what's a technology in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not always the technology devil. So it, there's a lot of great things that come out of technology, and nice. I think we can use those things to promote and to do things we couldn't do in the past. Right. Yeah. Yeah, man. Cause, you know, because like, and you know, that goes right into my next question. You know, some booming markets that we as you know as millennials should be paying attention to. You know, for those of us who are looking to get to invest and, and want and actually want to invest. What do you think are some booming markets that we should get into? Like, I, 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 and I've always, I've always, you know, uh, you know a big promoter of uh, advocate of investing in tech, right? Because I feel like that's like, you know, because technology is what's going to come to, is what brings the change, right? Also, I'm also personally, I'm looking at, the, you know, the cannabis, the, in the, movie, the booming cannabis market, because that's a multi-billion dollar industry, you know, that's starting to be legalized over the, all over the country, and people are starting to realize that how much money this can, that, that, you know, this can actually make, right. as well as investing in, in you know, uh, black businesses. You know, so I think technology, you're right. So mm -hmm. uh, technology is gonna drive a bunch of different markets. Right. Uh, now whether, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and say, you gotta buy Apple, right? Um, I don't know what the, the next wave of technology is gonna be and, mm -hmm. and who should, who, who's gonna conquer that market, but you're right, technology's here to stay. You think it's a, it's a good, you know, safe bet to you know to invest into the giants. I don't know the, the leading in the, um, the market. You know, I mean, we've seen some we've seen some giants make some mishaps in the past. That mm -hmm. you know, uh, adapt or die, right? Right. And we've seen some giants that didn't adapt and they're no longer around. Right. Uh, you know, case in point, Blockbuster, right? Right. That right. was a, that was a giant. You know, twenty five years ago, Netflix there's no it. doubt. Mm -hmm. That was a safe bet. Mm, well, maybe it's not so safe. Right. right? So uh, so I you know I don't. I don't. I don't predict or even pretend to know the future. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I will. I will say there's always going to be a technology industry, right. and and that technology is is changing our world and will continue to change our world. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're investing in technology, that's a good thing. Right. Um, uh, I think you know there's people always going to have to eat. So mm -hmm. if you're investing in food, that's probably a good thing too. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think we're we're gonna get away from electricity. Now how it's produced or how it's managed, I'm not sure, but I think electricity is probably gonna be the wave of the future, right? I, yeah. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Right. Something's gotta power what we do. Now whether it's natural gas, whether it's what whether it's wind, whether it's whether it's ocean water, I don't know. Right, right. Uh, but I think the industry's gonna be around, right? right. So energy's gonna be around, technology's gonna be around, food's gonna be around. So I, I, I think when we start thinking long term you know, let's think about the things that are not going anywhere that, that we need to survive as a, as a race. Hmm. And those things will be around and those are good investments. Right. right? Um, you know, but I can't sit here and tell you which company. Any, uh, you know, uh, takes on the, on, the, on, the, on the booming cannabis market? Or? Uh, well, they got some things to work out, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a budding market, yeah. to point a pun. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, there's some things that need to be worked out, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, you know, how do you how do you get that into our current federal banking system, right? right. Um, so there's some issues that need to be worked out uh, because it's legal state but not legal feds. I mean, you have mm -hmm. federal bank. I mean, so there's some things that got to get worked out. Uh, and you know, like like any pharmaceutical, you know, pharmaceuticals big business. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, whether we're talking about cannabis or we're talking about the cure for diabetes or we're talking about you know high blood pressure medication, it's just pharmaceuticals. Right. Um, you know, if we're talking about entertainment, you know, whether we're talking about you know alcohol or we're talking about cannabis, if you're going to put it in the entertainment community, there's a there's a trillion dollar industry there. So, uh, you know, it's just a matter of where you categorize it and many other things that we do for uh, pharmaceuticals or that we do for entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, I, I don't see it any different than any other entertainment 
um, substance, right? So, mm -hmm. so if you're trying to categorize it, if you want to say, hey, it's social and it's it's an entertainment value, then stick it there with with alcohol and, and other entertainment things, right? Mm -hmm. If you're saying no, it's medicinal, then put it in with pharmaceuticals. Right. Um, but it's going to find a category, and it might find itself in, in a number mm -hmm. of categories, okay. right? Uh, at some point, it's going to find a category. And because right now, everybody's just like, you know, you know, let me open my own dispensary and doing it that way. You know, I mean, but that's that's how budding industry starts, right? Mm -hmm. You know, somebody had to make the first bottle of whiskey, right? right. So, you know, I'm uh, looking, I wonder who's going to be the Facebook of that industry, though. Yeah, don't know, don't know. Who's, right? some, somebody has to be the Facebook. Yeah, somebody's got to be the IBM, right? Somebody's mm -hmm. got to be the first computer, right? right. Uh, you know, uh, and then somebody's got to take them out because they're going to build something better, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I think it's exciting just the fact that uh, you know, anytime there's a new industry budding, there's always the turmoil of, of who's going to rise on top and mm -hmm. who's going to who's going to uh, what laws are going to be put in place to make it work mm -hmm. you know so that's that's all going to be derived and probably solved over the next five to ten years right uh, uh, and it, it's going to be interesting to watch mm -hmm. uh, you know but uh, to predict where to go with it now yeah. it's way too early to way, it's way too early yeah you know same you know same same thing is uh is, is crypto I don't even understand crypto as much cryptocurrency yeah cryptocurrency you know cryptocurrency you know in the blockchain I feel like the blockchain is going to be you know you know it's, it's gonna it, it's it's Somehow, some form of way, the block the blockchain is going to be relevant. You know, I don't know how. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> At some point, it's going to be relevant, right? Yeah. Uh, but again, that's you know, that's that's looking to try to hit the home runs, right? Everybody wants to get rich quick. Oh, yeah. right. So like, everybody, you know, like people who maxing out credit cards buying Bitcoin. Right. You know, I mean, you know, so but when those, it was supposed to go up. You know, those are not sound financial decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, I never preach those things. I don't. I don't I subscribe to those things. I mean, if you want to have a hobby that uh that costs money and you want to go play in the market mm -hmm. that's great but make sure it's hobby money right right you know i, I like income. i like yeah. to play golf right you know so i go play my greens fees and i don't expect the only return i get is me to enjoy a day of golf mm -hmm. right you know so if you've got a hobby and your hobby you want to research this stuff and, and do some things at it make sure it's hobby money mm -hmm. but make sure you have a core investment portfolio that's sound that's built in, in fundamentals that that you're using professional management right mm -hmm. and if you want to have a hobby that may accelerate that or you may lose it i mean i don't you know, whether it's in the markets, your hobby, whether it's the golf course or country club membership so that you can go play when you want to play or right, right, a pool right. membership so you can swim. Just just understand that in your priorities of things, that that's somewhere down the list. It's right. not above your food. It's not above your rent. And it's not causing you to live outside your means. Right. So, okay. So what about in the importance of investing in black businesses? Uh, same thing, right? Same you know, uh, uh, we talked about uh, a black business, but what we're really talking about is investing in superior products. Right. Okay. Right. Because yeah. that's really what you want to invest in. You mm -hmm. want to invest in superior products, and I don't care where they come from. If it's a superior product, that's where you want to invest in because that's where that's where the money's going. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to fly off the shelf. Is that which that which is better? Now, there's some argument that says, yeah, you just need a better marketing scheme. But at the end of the day, everybody's a market critic. Mm -hmm. Because before you had to wait to see it on CNN News or somebody had to pick it up on a, on a news cycle. Now, now you just everybody that tries yeah, you it, could, you could just turn your phone. We'll on give you opinion, right. and you know they, it doesn't matter what you know the networks are saying about it. If you're looking at the reviews and everybody tries this, man, that's the worst tasting stuff ever. People are going to stop buying it, right? Right. So, so produce a superior product, develop, d deliver a superior service, mm -hmm. and get mm -hmm. superior results. Right. And you know if that business happens to be black owned more power to you mm -hmm. uh, so I think we need to shift our paradigm to producing superior products and superior experiences for not just our people but for all people right. and therefore we will have booming black businesses right okay so all right, can we can, can I get you to break down the seven sources of income and why is it important to have multiple sources uh, I'm gonna sum that up pretty quickly. Okay, um, okay it's a lot. Yeah. It is a lot. Uh, but the reality is, is that if you need more information, go to your website. There you go. <laughs> uh, you know, but the reality is, is when you talk about income and streams, I mean, nobody, nobody's coming running to America for the land of the job, mm -hmm. right? You know, and sometimes you'll hear people quip that job stands for journey of the broke. You know, but the reality is, is that um, opportunity. Is, is really alive and well in, in global markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you need to have sources of income that allows you to, to maximize the opportunities that you want for yourself. Right. Um, uh, if you own your job, that's great. Um, but just, you know, uh, I, you know, I think the statistic was, uh, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, 
um, or 50 years ago, 95% of people work for themselves and 5% work for corporations. That's completely flipped now. 95% mm -hmm. of people work for somebody else and only 5% work for themselves. You know, and that number is now growing. Yeah, entrepreneurship uh, is a big way. Uh, entrepreneur is now growing. Uh, you know, so um, uh, where your income comes from and the stability of your income, uh, it really depends on what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And how well you're doing it. Uh, and the market factors that surround what you're doing. Right. You know, so so don't be afraid to change because if you don't adapt, you'll die. And I don't care what you're good at, right. right? Because, you know, the best buggy whip maker in the world went out of business when cars took over. Hmm. Right. Especially if he started making cars. He was a buggy whip maker. He didn't even make horses. He made buggy whips, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 he had a booming industry. Right. But when that left, because he he didn't adapt. Right. You know, it's it's obsolete. And I think that's true with with our streams of income, right? You know, I don't have anything against jobs. I've had plenty of great jobs and great bosses, and and I think jobs are a great place to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but I always wanted to be my own boss. Right. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Facts. Um, you know, um, is it necessary? No. If you budget your money, it, pay yourself first, mm -hmm. live less than you make, you'll have mm -hmm. you'll have the wherewithal and the financial wherewithal to to do well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you are, if your desire is to run your own company, then you should do that. Um, you know, we have, you know, having your money work for you is, is a great way as a second stream of income. So if you're investing money and your money is making money, it doesn't take vacations. Mm -hmm. You know, as they say, when you, you know, it has kids, it's kids has kids, it's mm -hmm. kids has kids, they all go to work and right. there's no, there's no child labor. Like, like, yeah, like how, like how one, how one Buffett was quoted saying, you know, if uh, you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you'll work until you die. Absolutely. Right. So, you know, and then, and the other side of that is, is you have to invest money so that you can live on your money at right. some point. Um, you know, we we can argue and, and discuss of what's going to be around in 50 years, but mm -hmm. none of us really knows. Right. You know, but investing in yourself is always going to be on point. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and how you make your money, whether it's real estate, whether it's it's investments, whether it's jobs, whether it's franchising, whether it's flipping houses. There's so many. Whereas it's selling pencils, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, uh, toys, manufacturing, doing gaming. Your sales. There is, there are so many ways to make money, and there's probably thousands of ways I haven't even thought of yet, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or have, don't even exist yet. Right. You know, like Airbnbs that didn't exist, you know, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. Now that's a whole market, right? This whole industry. Mm -hmm. So there's ways. There's going to be ways to generate income that that don't even exist today. You know, uh, you know, the refinancing of cars didn't really exist when cars were three and four thousand dollars, but now the cars are fifty and sixty thousand dollars. A whole industry was birthed out of that. So, I mean, so we just don't know uh, what what it's going to be. But to secure your income, you mm -hmm. have got to adapt yeah. to the situation that the world is demanding because it's going to always demand the products and where it's going to send its money. And mm -hmm. if you're working in that industry, then you're always going to have secure income. You know, if you if you become obsolete, then your income is going to mm -hmm. become obsolete. Right. Uh, with that, you know, that, you know, with a you know piggyback off of that, how how should you know us in the, as millennials, you know, and you know other generations, should go about creating passive income for ourselves? Chase your passions. Hmm. Um, find something that you're passionate about. As somebody said, so find something you're passionate about, and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, find something that you're passionate about, and and turn that passion into a superior product and experience, and you'll generate income. And then invest invest those profits like we talked about. Mm -hmm. Use compounding interest. Use dollar cost averaging. Using all these little tools, mm -hmm. so that at some point, your money is making more money than you're making, or at mm -hmm. some point, work is optional. That's a clip. That's a clip right there. Ooh, that's a clip. Well, I'm gonna pull that, and that's ooh, that's, we're gonna blast that on social media on that one. I like how you I like how you worded that. Can you keep going with what you were saying? But just it's, it's, it's at some point you're going to be unable to work. Mm -hmm. You know, and so when that day comes, you want to be prepared. Right. You know, and so, you know, make sure that your income is coming in regardless of whether you get up and go to work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, at that point, it's passive. Right. You know, whether that's because you, you manage franchise or you've got uh, apartment complexes mm -hmm. or, or you just have an investment portfolio that's several million. Um, and you mm -hmm. decided and you've planned how you want to uh, mm -hmm. live your retirement, you know, because uh, I was asked a question not too long ago and somebody says, how much money I need to retire, Eric? And I get that question a lot, by the way. And 
I answered it with a question. I said, mm -hmm. well, how do you want to retire? If you want to live in a trailer on a beach in South America, that's that's one number. If you want to live in a mansion in Beverly Hills, that's a different number. Yeah. So the question isn't how much money you need to retire. The question is, how do you want to retire? And let's make a plan accordingly. Right. So the question is, you know, how do you make your money? It's, it's how do we want to plan? Mm -hmm. And let's plan accordingly. Right. Okay. So... Because earlier you said how you, you know, you, you, at one point you was an employee and now you're an entrepreneur, right? How do, how do we go about from, you know, getting from the left side of the cash flow crunch? Now I'm, I'm using, you know, rich dad, poor dad terminology again. You know, from... Well, that's not fair because everybody hasn't read the book. Well, they can Google the book. <laughs> and needs to go read the book, right? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, but I'll, I'll explain what the, what the cash flow conjuring is. You know, how to get from the left side to the right side. Now, on the left side, you have, on the left side of the cash flow quadrant, you know, it's four squares. You have employee, and then you have self-employed on the bottom, right? Then on the right side, you have business business owner, where, and then uh, an investor. Business owner meaning you have people working for you. How, how, how do we go about getting, getting from the left to the right? You know, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I can't remember who quoted it, but said, I'd much rather have the efforts of 100%, 1 of the efforts of 100 people than 100% of the efforts of one. Mm -hmm. You know, the ability to, to, to multiply and duplicate yourself or duplicate your efforts is where true wealth is gone. Right. You know, so uh, again, start, start with something you're passionate about, mm -hmm. develop a superior product, develop a superior service, deliver it to people with pride and with honesty. And then you will move because that in itself, people are going to want more of that. Mm -hmm. And then that will move you as you move across the quadrants from being an employee to being an entrepreneur to being a business owner. You know, it's your concept. It's your, it's your system that's going to generate wealth, right? Because an organization doesn't rise to its potential. Right. It basically shrinks to the, the level of its infrastructure. Right, so it doesn't matter that you've got the best ideas to site plan. If your infrastructure can only support a hundred thousand dollar business a year, that's as big as you're going to grow. Mm -hmm. The potential that's two million is left unchecked because your infrastructure has to be there. So you have to develop a superior system, okay, a superior product, superior service, so that you can continue to reach higher and higher levels. Okay. Um, all right. So one my one of my my second and last question, right, is. What are some good books that everyone should be reading to gain some financial knowledge, solid financial knowledge, other than Rich Dad Poor Dad? Because we quoted that book like we did twice. Um, the Bible. Okay. The Everything. Bible talks about financial knowledge. The, the Bible talks about money more than it talks about love. Does it really? It does. Uh, check the past. Somebody's gonna Google me and fact check me. I think I got <laughs> it right. Um, I like a small book called The Richest Man in Babylon. I got that book. Um, I think it's a great fun way mm -hmm. to learn some very interesting. Uh, Financial concepts. Okay. Um, you have the millionaire next door. Don't have that. One. Um, you have uh, a, a, a a new book called Everyday Millionaires that just came out, which is actually the largest study done on millionaires since the Millionaire Next Door. Okay. So it's a newer version of it, but you can't really appreciate it unless you read the Millionaire Next Door. But it it stands on its own. It's called Everyday Millionaires. Okay. And I think if you read those four or five books, you will be able to develop. You think Intelligent sense. Investor should be one too? Um, I think so, but I don't think that's a first book. Okay. I don't think that's a first read. Uh, you know, uh, I think those the, the books that we mentioned are, are yeah. kind of basic fundamental books. Okay. You know, and of course, Think and Grow Rich. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, those, the original or the, or the black one? Um, I I think you should read both. Okay. Um, because you might not agree with some of the paradigms that uh, that the assumptions that are made or some of the stereotypes that are that are that are stated, but. Um, I think those will give you the basic fundamental to have a firm foundation, and then from that foundation you can always grow. Okay. You, know, you, you never know, stop learning. Facts. You know. You know. You always got to be a student in the game. Yeah. Always, we got to be a student in the game. You know. And you know. Adapt or die. Facts. <clears throat> How would you? Now, see that that just spawned a whole other question. All right. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll just ask it. You know, how how do you advise someone you know to continue to be a student in the game when they possibly probably may have been turned off? Um. You know. Disappointment is a learning opportunity, mm -hmm. and you can either embrace it and learn lessons over losses, and 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 move forward. You know, as they say, experience is a tough teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, so you can learn. You can learn from others' mistakes, uh, and you can move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, you really you're really not lost until you quit. Facts. So don't Facts. quit. Get up. Dust yourself off, and try again. 
I got a tattoo on my chest. Hey, it's over you losses. Know, what? Can, you know, Colonel Sanders went to 109 different places before he got a loan for Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yep. You know, the four bankers turned Walt Disney down told me nobody would ever go to a theme park. That's childish. Mm hmm. You know, there's, there's, which there's, is what Pee was marketing to. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you know, there's, there's a banker that's dancing the bank. There's four that you know that one jump off a bridge, right? Right. So I mean, you know, a, a, a failure is not a failure unless you give up. Mm. It, it's got to be a way to learn so that you can get better. Mm -hmm. You know, so embrace them, get better. Yeah. Don't make the same mistake over right. again. Yeah, in fact, you know, that's what that's that's what a bunch of you know, if you listen to multi <clears throat> multi millions of beers, they'll they'll sit there and tell you. They learn way more from their failures than they do anything else. And, and, the, and the, there's very few of them will say, oh, got it right the first time. Right. Right out the gate. Got mm -hmm. it right. Doesn't happen. I mean, you look look, look at look at the guy who invented Alibaba, right? Was denied from Harvard for like, what, four times? <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, he, how many businesses did he create that failed? Fail. You know, uh, he, they, like, it was like wrong, 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 and then right. eventually he got it right. You know, and that's that's learning, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if we knew exactly what to do, we would do it. You do it if you already had the answer. You already had the answer. Mm -hmm. The fact is, is you don't know the answer, so you have to go find it and figure it out and learn and mm -hmm. figure it out. And that that requires a lot of oops, a lot yep. of mistakes, a lot of do overs. Yeah, you know, uh, and that's okay. Yeah, that's yep. okay because all all. All things worth having require work, mm -hmm. and if it was easy, everybody would do it, and they'd have no value. Right. You know, but this finance thing is not rocket science. It is not. It's it, not. It's simple. It's just not easy. The equation is like we quoted how many how many times did we how say many times did we say pay yourself first, manage your debt, minimize debt, reinvest profits. <laughs> yeah, reinvest. That actually might be the title. You know. <laughs> Uh, that actually might be the time. You know, I mean, that's just, that's just, that's the basic, that's the basic blocking and tackling there. Mm -hmm. That's that's the basic things. If you don't do those three things, you are spinning in a circle. Right. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether the, you have the latest and greatest idea. If you're not managing your debt, paying yourself first, and investing for the long haul, mm -hmm. then, you know, you're, you're, you're decreasing your odds of success monumentally. Facts, facts. Okay, so my very last question for you, man, is how do you plan on using your voice to leave an impact on the world? I would like to change one family at a time, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I had a, a goal when I first started this business that every time one of my clients got to a million dollars, they'd have to hang my picture over the mantle of their fireplace. Huh? And, <laughs> I, and, and I want to have my pictures in so many houses, people think I come with the frame. That's actually pretty. That's a pretty good idea. That's a pretty good goal, man. Right. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, I got that frame in my house too. Yeah, so do we. Yeah, I, you know. So I'd like to impact those families. And they change their family tree. Mm -hmm. Facts. Okay, man, that's, that's great, man. That's a great goal, man. Uh, with that being said, let the people know how can they get in touch with you, with you again. All right, so you can reach out to me at 225-678-6185. Or you can hit me on the website at www.royalcapitalmanagementgroup.com. All right, man. That was it. That's, that pretty much wraps up the whole interview right there, man. It was fun. You know, it was it was a great talk. I'm glad to have you on the show. Well, CJ, man. thanks for having me. Appreciate it, man. You know, pleasure. Yes, sir. Man. I hope everybody who tuned in, listening on either on any streaming uh, podcast streaming platform, you know, found or watched the video, watching the video on YouTube, found tremendous value in this episode, man. You know, if you did, I ask that you click, please click that like button. You know, to give me some thumbs up and. If you feel inclined to do so, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. That way you'll be updated whenever I drop a new episode to the channel. That being said, this is CJ King. I'm joined with Eric King. And this is you watching the CJ Brand Experience episode 27. We're out.